Base is dropped in a no dilly, no dally zone here on a wall pass Wednesday on Soccer Down Here Soccer's Morning Show. John here, Tyler there, you out there, and Maddie Cruz on the ones and twos. The reason Tyler is here 10 minutes early uh, is I had to move the batting order up a little bit. As we mentioned yesterday, Tyler's going to be on in his normal slot just 10 minutes early. We take him to 9.30. 9.30, we get to catch up on the city of Roswell and the announcement and the press conference yesterday with Justin Papadakis from USLHQ coming up to hang out with the folks in Roswell. We'll find out as much as we can about what's going on in Roswell with the stadium and thoughts and where it might be and what the timetables are, those kinds of things. We'll see if we can get at 9.30. Hopefully, Dylan Butler can join us at 10. And we have our inaugural member. As we reset the as we reset the uh, the poster on the wall to zero, we have our inaugural member of the SDH Hall of Stupid, and he's already in Hall of Fame status. He just did something else that's stupid, and uh, I'm always torn about doing these kinds of things. But if we ignore stupid, stupid continues to fester. So this is why we're going to let th- that happen. We're going to talk about that in hour two, but this is hour one. So that means that Tyler's here. And where would you like to start? Uh, would you like to start with other things around Major League Soccer? Would you like to start about the Euros? Would you like to start about Atlanta United now that you've had a couple of days to think about what, uh, what's what been going on? You know, I, I don't know how much more I want to think about Atlanta United, that, that match last weekend. Um, I mean, it's perfectly fine. I mean, the, the probably the best thing that we can, you know, the, do to move the story forward, advance it, is that it was an opportunity for the younger players and uh, you know, a, you know, a guy like Noah Cobb that we know is on that track to first team minutes and first team exposure. It was another one of those environments where you could get Noah Cobb the chance to get those minutes and get him the exposure that uh, you're looking for because he is that talented an individual. Yeah, you know, I watched this game and the defense. I know that's always going to be the buzzword, Mm -hmm. but it wasn't awful. Noah Cobb, I actually thought did pretty well. There were some mistakes, but there were some mistakes by everybody. Um, The attack though was just toothless. You know, the attack just, it wasn't there. It didn't have any cohesiveness to it. And I think that was the biggest thing out of this entire game was it was just, you know, we talk about the chemistry. We've talked about the chemistry all season and, that's been the other big buzzword, right? You're hitting buzzwords out of the blocks. I know. Morning. I'm look. I got. I'm on my second cup already this morning, and I'm, <laughs> I'm on it. What, um, what, is, what is the mug, by the way? I forget. The mug have. this morning is look. It's it's like one of those tin tin mugs or whatever the metal ones. So you're out there at the campfire making sure that everything yeah. is drowned. <laughs> might be something else in here this morning that I'm sing, singing songs at the campfire, and Tyler <laughs> might have something a little a little brown. Yeah, not, a little, a little softer brown than the, the traditionally what might be in that in that mug. So yeah. I just know where you're going? Please continue. Maybe. Um, <laughs> Great Wolf you. Lodge over in Lagrange. Ah, okay. I'm d- so. I'm down with I'm down with OPP. There you go. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you hit yeah. buzzwords. You hit buzzwords again this morning. Yes, buzzwords. Chemistry. The chemistry just didn't seem like it was there. Which, you know, you can talk about chemistry all day long, but you take five guys, six guys out of that lineup. Yeah. It's not going to be easy. It doesn't matter what kind of training you're doing on the training ground. It just doesn't work that way. And, you know, knock on wood, you hope this is the worst experience that you had with your backups because it, you're going to have this more this year. Um, maybe a little less so, RIP to Greece. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, that that conversation in the, uh, in the locker room between uh, two individuals on the front line, I don't know what that conversation is going to be like. Yeah, that yeah, uh, yeah. It in in the, it's just you know it, but regardless, it, it puts the team in a position now where you, you have to the the young guys have to come out and perform. I mean, the the talents there, we know the talents there, mm-hmm. and then yeah, you 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 know you go back to the the second and third striker conversation. And it's like all right, well, at least you've got Yakamakis now. At least you've got a guy that you know can make something out of nothing. And you may or may not have Saba, considering Saba didn't get the call up this time around. Yep. Does the Georgian national team sit there and say we're going to go, we're going to dance with what we brung as they go into the Euros? Yep. And I mean, on the right hand side, you look if Saba does go, then you know you have Edwin Mosqueda running around at ninety miles an hour, and you do that for sixty minutes, and then maybe you have Tyler on the right hand side. You move uh, 
you might move Brooks up because that's happened in the past. So there are alternatives there on the right. Yeah, and and this is not at all a knock on the backup strikers, which is yes. a cursed position at Atlanta United. But I I am much more comfortable mm-hmm. with losing Saba and having Mosquera Wolf uh, insert other winger here because we have so many. And that's not a knock on Saba either. But I feel better about that, you know, than I do losing Yakamakis and and having to have Jamal Tiara or well, Daniel Rios. You're right. And Daniel Rios, once again, Daniel Rios got his first couple of minutes and it was just, okay, Daniel, go. And, and yeah. once Daniel gets oriented into what's going on, I think he becomes more comfortable as another option up top. And he brings you a different option than you do than you have with Jamal. Jamal, the more more of the the basketball analogy, more of the power forward type where yeah. Daniel Rios is more your shooting guard. So you have those alternatives available to you in that position when you go to the bench for someone other than Gigi. Yeah, and at some point, you just have to hope that one of them breaks the curse. Because the only one that came close to breaking the curse was Dom Dwyer, really. Yeah. And, I mean, I think you can you can understand to a degree why he wasn't brought back. I, I still think maybe his his style of play wasn't exactly what Pineda wanted. And I, fine. and I think that he also wanted to be closer to his, uh, to his children. And, 100%, and yeah. as a dad, you completely get that. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. And, and I would never, I've never fault him for that. You know, and I think people they are like, Oh, why did this happen? Well, you have to look at family because ultimately that's what is the most important. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, he was the one that had somewhat of a successful tenure <laughs> behind yeah the first striker and you know it's not the end of the world for Jamal Tiare I mean this is the first time he's really had a cohesive like real start you know and he and he's actually got significant time did he make the most of it probably not but I hope that bringing in Daniel Rios will help kind of force him to not settle for just being the second I hope that he's not okay with being the second because he doesn't want to be the third either and yeah. I hope that it pushes both of them to try to even push Yako for time if it comes down to when he needs a break. You know, you don't want to force Yako because if you don't have to, it would be nice knowing his injury history to be able to kind of let him back off a little bit if you can. But right now, you don't have that luxury. And at the same time, I, I think that our conversation and the fact that you have this early in the year where you can sit there and see, okay, how do things integrate with the depth of the roster that's there when they have to integrate with the with the first starting 11 as we have that in our brains that you you look at you know you once again you you look at how things blend and it is situational and it's like okay you had seven guys that you're used to having on your roster out for either injury or international duty and it, it, it is a learning experience. It is it is a chance for Atlanta United to sit there and say, okay, how do these pieces fit? How do we learn to continue to make these pieces fit later on in the year when the Euros pop up, when we have injuries, these kinds of things. So I, I chalked, I literally, I chalked this one up to a, a learning experience and seeing how folks come together in a situation like this. And you, you, you take it and go. And, you, you know, and one other element that I did want to talk about with you is Brad Gazan because uh, the polar bear had some sick, and I mean that in the most optimistic way possible, as the kids say these days. He had some sick moments against Toronto where he was coming up with saves all over the place. Yeah, and we're we're a few games in now, and I think all of the, the talk over the past year and a half mm-hmm. has more or less ceased, or, or at least should have ceased. I... Th- there's nothing wrong with Brad right now in that that starting goalkeeper spot. And I think it's a mixture of having a guy like Josh Cohen, who you know is is good, who you know is hungry, and who you know is going to take that spot if he's given the opportunity. Right. And Brad is the kind of guy that feeds off of that. But also, you know, I've said it. I think I've said it on here. I've said it on our show. It, it's just the guy was injured. Right, like he was in, like really badly. And he was an Achilles, that, and that ain't something that you can fix quick. Right, and the, you know he came, but he came back so quickly from that, like almost supernaturally quick. And then he, you know, gets up to New York City last year on the baseball field and and messes up his knee, and then he's back 
like well, instantly after that. that and, well, and dude rolled into him. Yeah. And got, and got no card. Got yes. No, Al got no card, and Brad had to go through that too. And Brad played the rest of that match because that happened right before halftime. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, so we know he wants to be on the field. He he's He's at the tail end of his career. That's not a secret, and that's not a knock. But he's going to milk every moment for everything it's worth. And I'm not mad at that at all. But I think it was easy to look back at results last year and think, man, his shot stopping ability is just not great. Well, I mean, if my knee was hanging on by a thread and I just fixed my Achilles with duct tape, you know, like it, it probably wouldn't be that great for any of us either, but he had this break. He had the off season and he just looks better. He looks, I keep saying springy and spry. That's what he looks like to me. He just looks like he's got, he's got some youthfulness back in his legs and, we already know his positioning typically is pretty good. Um, he's got the experience. We know that. And I think now that he's had the moment to rest and get everything, his confidence back into his legs, he looks good. And I'm not mad at what he's brought at all, even in an O2 loss. Like it is what it is. Again, it's not his fault. He was coming up with some saves left and right. That game could have been way worse than it was. Oh man. I mean, the, the point blank one where, uh, that's it's two camera left as we're watching and so the the one that's point blank where he literally is there and he is it's like he is he is the lone ranger yep and and the shot is there and i think he hits it twice he's inside his six i think he's about two yards off of the line he hits it twice and powers it over the bar yep and it's those kinds of moments where you sit there and go dude was dude was on his head yeah we can use every you know goalie analogy you want he was a warlock he was on a standing on his head whatever (laughs) i like Uh, the warlock well, I mean, well, I mean, you can't call him a witch. Yeah, you? that's true. Therefore, you know, you have to call him a warlock. But, <laughs> uh, but there are some things. There, there are things for Atlanta United to learn. There are things for us to learn about Atlanta United as this process goes. Because, like I said, you're going to have cup competitions. You're going to, you know, you're you're going to be in Open Cup. You're going to have Leagues Cup. You're going to have Euros. You're going to have injuries. And to have a moment like this early in the year, I think is is beneficial. Yes, yes. Uh, is it uh, suboptimal that you came out of there with no points? Absolutely. But, you know, you learn from this kind of a thing and you, and you go forward. Uh, it also wasn't 6-1 Columbus last year either. True. Yes, so. <laughs> that is absolutely true. Tyler hanging out with us for another 10 minutes at ATL Pilgrim at Scarves and the letter N spikes on the 280 character app. Tyler joins us every Wednesday here on Wall Pass Wednesday because God knows what we want to talk about with Tyler and God knows what we want to talk about on a Wall Pass Wednesday, whatever's on the table. Uh, we do have some Twitch Pitchian uh, questions. And Abby asks, do you think MLS needs to break during international breaks? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, you know, I was writing my my article over on Scarves and Spikes, my my first reaction kind of article. There you the go. moment the final yeah. whistle hit. Get the against plug. Tor- there Toronto. There you go, big guy. I, you know. Um, my my final reaction, and it was maybe a little hotter than I meant to it, but it, I don't think it's that spicy of a take. It's just, you know, the way MLS's schedule works, like the teams that pay money to get international players, they inevitably get punished in times like this, and it sucks. It sucks. You know, it's been like this for a long time, mm-hmm. but it it's not that difficult to just, move some things around a little bit now granted this year was extremely full yes extremely full so and, i get the maybe next, i think next year is just as full and then you head into a world cup year too yeah yeah so i mean the world cup year is going to be tough bananas uh, foster sir yes <laughs> yeah but yeah yeah i mean to answer the to answer the question simply yes i mean i i, I think they need to take a break um i turned on my my TV that morning, not thinking about it at all because I was so ready for the Atlanta game. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, you know, I got the day off up until the match and I, we're not going to the bins. And I was like, I'm going to watch some Premier League. Nope. Nope. <laughs> you got well, you got you got championship league one and league two, brother. You got yep. that. Yep. I ended up watching. Um, I think it was Man City and Man U, the, the women's match that morning. WSL. OK, yep. I'm down with that. So which was awesome. But, you know, it just. 
the, the European mind can't comprehend. Like, it's just such a weird thing, you know? Yes. So it sh they should take a break, figure out a way, whether you got to stretch it out. I don't know. Whatever you got to do to make it work. It's just frustrating. Yep. Yeah. And uh, then Ricky asks, so are we missing Bart Sleesh and likely Saba for the Euros? I would say yes on Sleesh. Don't know about Saba considering what happened yesterday. And do you deal with the, the poker hand that you have there? Do you Did you have Saba sit there and go, you know, bro, take a seat. And if we make the Euros, then we call you up. Saba's the wild card in this. This is what we don't know. Yeah. Uh, I think if I had to put money on it, I wouldn't put a lot of money on it. But if I had to put money on it, I would say Saba does get called up because he has been a, a pretty consistent guy for them, you know, over the over the past what, however long, a couple of years. Yeah. I, I think he, I think he gets called back up because I just don't know that you want to go into such an important competition, missing that kind of experience. Yeah. Sometimes you just let guys have a break. Now this was a weird one because it was such an important qualifier. Right. And that's why I'm like, I don't yeah, know. it's tough, but I, I just, I'm kind of leaning towards, yes, probably he misses it. And then of course, slish. Absolutely. Yeah, and then what that means in the midfield once again is that's why you have Dax McCarty here, and that's why you would, in theory, have Jay Fortune here as well. So uh, the those absences at that position, specifically the six, can be addressed with other folks. So uh, as we sit here and play uh, roster Jenga when we get to the summer and the calendar. So I think that that particular position, you have allowances that you can make with, with a combination of, say, Jay and Dax to fill that 90 minutes where you bring in Dax and you go to the bullpen with 20 to go and sit there and it's like, all right, finish it out for me. Um, Chicago's coming up, and the issue that I foresee with Chicago, well, actually it's two now, one is a negative if you are a fan of the Chicago Fire, and the other is a positive if you are a fan of the Chicago Fire. Uh, Hugo Kuyper seems to be a pretty decent play so far in yeah. MLS Fantasy. And if you haven't joined the Fantasy League here at uh, SDH, go to the Jason Wright Agency Facebook page, Jason Wright with a W, or Jason Wright with a W-A-G-E-N on the 280-character app. Hugo Kuyper so far seems to be uh, putting the ball in the back of the net, and Chicago's playing uh, – DJ crazy pants sometimes when it's out there offensively and uh, Kuypers is definitely somebody you got to spot shadow. Yeah. Um, I was, it's so funny cause I was just about to bring this up, but I think Niall hit it in the, the pitch first. You don't have to worry about the wind. There's True. no wind, windy goals. It is a climate controlled environment inside Mercedes Benz stadium. Yep. But you know, I, I never know with Chicago. They, they are such a, up and down team like like always not just i mean this year they, they've been relatively okay mm -hmm. but they're just you never know what you're going to get out of them but you do know that they've never won in atlanta which you have going for you so you know i think of course you're going to be missing steon which still sucks at least to a, to a couple of weeks maybe a month don't know rehab can take it one way or the other but yeah yeah so i, I do feel like this defense still is more than capable of handling uh, Mr. Kuypers, mm -hmm. but I, it's more about the, the transition from them up to the front that I'm concerned about. And I think that was what was missing so much in this last match. And of course you're going to have guys coming back and everything. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm, I'm still confident about it. I just think after this Toronto match, you, you turn this into more of a, "Quote unquote must win," which yeah. all your home matches should be must win anyway. Yeah, but it was it would have been nice to kind of pad some things a little bit by getting at least a point up in Toronto. So, you know, yes, you're they're going to go into it. They're going to scout him. They're going to look at him, and and they're going to I think they're going to handle him pretty well. Uh, William Morthland, the uh, mayor pro tem of the city of Roswell, post five council member, who's going to discuss the uh, Justin Papadakis uh, press conference, USLHQ, coming up in a couple of minutes. And then my last thought with you has to do with the injuries that they have at left back, where we saw Andrew Gutman's injury early in the season, and you, you had to have Chase Gasper, who was a sub, subbed off because of injury. We don't know the injury update on Gasper. But that makes you very thin at left back, which in the Atlanta United attack up the right hand side 
I say that is probably where you're looking at making the most of your opportunities early on and running them into the ground up your attacking right, which means field day for Brooks and for uh, Saba up the right-hand side going up against a very thin left-back issue for the Chicago Fire. Yeah, I think um, you bring in – obviously, you start Saba. And then, then you run Edwin Mosquera yeah, for 30 minutes. Then you run minutes. Edwin Mosquera nonstop. <laughs> and I, what I want to see a lot of uh-huh. is, you know, because they're going to pick on that right side. They have to, mm-hmm. absolutely have to. So you're, you're going to see Atlanta's left back, you know, depending on who's starting with rest and all that kind of stuff. But let's, you know, Caleb Wiley. Sure. Um, whoever that is, I want to see long balls over the top. I want to see them bypassing that midfield because – if Atlanta plays it right, they're going to draw the inexperienced left back, left wing of Chicago in tight, and then you're going to leave that right wing completely wide open. And gotcha. you're going to give you know Saba and Edwin plenty of space to run, plenty of acres with a picket fence and, and grass and the whole nine yards to just oh, have fun. The, the can of white paint and the whole deal. Yeah, the whole nine yards. Air so hug, that's, man, that's what I want to see. Yep. Uh, Daniel, show me sand f- sand the floor. Uh, okay. So uh, I know before you go, you've got something to talk about coming up real soon. So go ahead and talk about what's coming up real soon. Yeah. So uh, she believes cup is coming up April 6th. I've heard we you. are going to be doing a live show at the nest on four bar. Again, we did it for the home opener. Oop, oop. Uh, that's at the Signia hotel, big glass hotel right next to the bins. Yeah. So if you're going, Come after the match. We're going to be doing, uh, well, after both matches, doubleheader. So we're looking to start at 630. That's not nailed down yet, but we'll say 630. Um, come hang out with us, and we're going to do that to recap the whole doubleheader for She Believes and okay. lead into kind of a watch party slash watch along type deal for the Atlanta night game that night. There you go. Uh, Tyler Pilgrim at ATL uh, Pilgrim at Scarves and Spikes on the 280 character app. Our buddies from Scarves and Spikes hanging out with us. And Tyler gets to hang out with us every Wednesday and sit there and go, why am I hanging out with John? Why does he drive me crazy? Because I love uh, it. It's fun. <laughs> we have well, a great time. Well, Wall Pass Wednesdays are about, my friend. Thanks for hanging out. Thank and you. And we'll catch up with you soon. See y'all. That is Tyler. And so Tyler is going to go continue drinking coffee out of his tin cup. Uh, yesterday, as we transition. Yesterday, big press conference, 2 o'clock yesterday afternoon with folks from the city of Roswell and our friends from the USL. Lifetime, well, early Roswell resident Justin Papadakis, who is chief uh, deputy chief executive officer and the chief revenue, uh, chief real estate officer. So deputy CEO, chief real estate officer. There's a lot of uh, initials in there in alphabet soup. But Justin Papadakis, city of Roswell, Mayor Kurt Miller, they had a press conference, a Q&A about something that's happening over the next little bit uh, in the city of Roswell, hanging out with us now, is the mayor pro tem of the city of Roswell. And he is post five council member, mayor pro tem, William Morthland. Uh, mayor Morthland, thanks for hanging out with us here on the morning show. Good morning. How's it going? Doing all right. Uh, thanks for, for doing this, especially on a short notice and a quick turn. But uh, now that you have had what, the sum total of, uh, let's see, nine 9.30, so I'm trying to subtract, say 16 and a half hours to <laughs> digest what happened yesterday w- with the city of Roswell and with the USL. What do you think? It's fantastic. It is fantastic. We, um, we had a great day yesterday. This, this was the culmination of probably a year, a little bit over a year worth of fantastic work that the city – along with the United uh, Soccer League has put together in identifying how Roswell can fit a very, very nice niche for them. And, and they approached the city of Roswell and said, you know, what do you think about doing this? This is a great idea. And this is a crazy idea. Would y'all be accepting of this idea? And it just, it grew and, and we were off to the races. We are thrilled to be welcoming with open arms the USL to Roswell. This is this is going to be amazing. But the big thing that that is really going to set us apart here is we are putting a focus on the women's game. This is going to be a, a stadium and, and uh, economic uh, benefit to a, a certain area, which has not been identified yet. But we are going to be putting all the resources that we need to into identifying the highest and best use of, of real estate here in Roswell to build a preeminent women's centric soccer stadium. 
and that is part of a mixed use development opportunity. The the I mean the the economics and and the possibilities that are going to grow from this. It, it's something that Roswell's never seen before. That is that is just the excitement that is is building. The phone has been ringing off the hook for the past, as you say, 16 and a half hours. And uh, yeah, I mean, we, we are all spread thin. The mayor is, is triple booked. Uh, other council members are double booked. Economic development is, is all over the place. We are, we are rolling. This is, this is a fantastic announcement from uh, the city of Roswell in, in conjunction with the United States Soccer League. So the USL yeah, came USL. to the city of Roswell. To, yes. to sit there and say, hey, we've got an idea. We've got an idea. And <clears throat> that is that is where any idea can either grow or or fall off the side. When they came with the idea, we said, yeah, let's let's foster this idea. Let's grow this idea. Let's incubate this idea. How can we push this forward? Because we are certainly interested in doing this. This uh, this this new idea and I, I hate to call it a new idea, but this this push for the women's side of thing is what is going to make us a, a different marketplace. We are absolutely in the market for the men's soccer as well. No question about that, but this is front and center women's game. When it comes to the place where the, the live work play environment is being sought after inside the city of Roswell, and this is something that the USL has, has, had as one of their cornerstones for development, especially in their, their men's leagues, where in Statesboro, Georgia, you have the live, work, play idea being developed. You had the same thing in East Ridge, Tennessee with their Chattanooga franchise. We had uh, a lot of our uh, private eyes that, that listen and watch the show yesterday as we were walking through the announcement, sitting there saying, now, okay, so here's, here's the city limits of Roswell. And here's where it might be able to work and it might be able to work here. And I had some ideas. How many different sites are we looking at? And this is inside the city limits proper or is this like in Milton or what are we what are we staring at here for a number of sites? This is absolutely within the city of the limits of Roswell. Got it. Um, have not nailed down, but we have many, many opportunities in many places that we're looking at. You know, do we have a number? Several. Several would be the number at this point, and I've been ve given very clear guidance that that needs to be where we <laughs> where we settle that question. But, Absolutely. Uh, is this is this a uh, a dream? Is this a hope and a dream? And we're just going to throw it up and see if it works? No, we we've done a lot more due diligence on this. We would not be in this place with this announcement um, if we had not done all the, the the work that has gotten us to this point. So we are we are committed. We are serious. The USL is serious, and and just seeing the twinkle in Justin's eye yesterday was was something that you know you you just can't replicate that anywhere else. He is very proud. He is a Roswell resident. He is uh -huh. very proud to be bringing this home. I was going to say when you got a Horseshoe Bend guy who wants to to bring an idea of live work play back home, that that adds a different dimension and probably an acceleration of purpose because right now it's a letter of intent to uh, New Year's Eve and it can be extended after that. It, it seems like the USL is profoundly motivated is probably the best way that I can describe it, especially with a Horseshoe Bend uh, resident, uh, you know, grow, a guy who grew up in Horseshoe Bend and Justin Papadakis that was a part of this discussion. To use the word profound would be exactly what Roswell would be as well. Okay. I, I would say USL is profound in this. Roswell is equal. We are we are welcoming. This is a great marriage. We are welcoming one another with open arms. I know that sounds kind of kind of corny and cliche, but again, back to my prior statement, we would not be in this situation if we have not done the due diligence to make sure that this is a an idea that not only is going to work, but is going to be successful. William Morthland, Post 5 Council Member, Mayor Pro Tem of the City of Roswell, and he is also the liaison to community development and economic development. And having that on the business card also helps out this discussion. When it comes to Roswell and it being an economic driver up Georgia 400 and spreading across both sides, because as we explain this to listeners outside the footprint and viewers outside the footprint, Georgia 400 is like if you look at a map of the city of Atlanta and you have Interstate 285 
And then you have Georgia 400, which basically goes from the center of the clock right up through 12 noon. Yep. You're going right up to Roswell and in that area. For those that aren't necessarily as familiar with Roswell and how things have gone economically and in a development sense over, say, the last five years, how has Roswell grown to be able to be confident that you can have this 8,000 to 15,000 live, work, play stadium situation available to you that you can handle? So the, the stadium that we're, we're running with is going to be a 10,000 square foot, 10,000 seat stadium with the uh, accelerant of being able to expand to 15. And, and getting back to, to the original question, how can we handle this? Mm -hmm. the, the economics, the, the household median income here in Roswell will certainly be able to do this along with the neighboring uh, areas that will be funneling into the Roswell Roswell area for game days, not just game days, but all the things that come with this economic driver. The we Roswell has uh, a map that has exclusive rights over the team. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be a map that extends from a little bit south of Roswell to the east, to the west, to the north. So we are we are having the exclusive rights to um, what we're looking to do with this this team, not only the team teams and the live, work, play development area. We are when, just working this through right now. Yeah, so when it comes to – so this sounds like it's Sandy Springs to Milton to Cobb County and over, If I, if uh, I mean, unless I'm talking in a very, very short idea when it comes to the, the geographic footprint that you're, that you're attached to. How much of a soccer fan or how much of fans of the sport – is the city council coming in and the, and the mayor coming in? How, how much of a soccer fan were you, were you uh, folks as a group before this discussion even started with Justin and the USL? Very much so. The mayor, <laughs> some of our personal stories, the mayor uh, was a high school soccer player uh -huh. way back in the early days uh, during the, the Huntsville, Alabama, early days of, of soccer first coming to the South. He was a very, very fast player. He was a football player. He was a boxer in the, the Army. But, it, and I share that with you to say he was an athlete. When soccer first originated within his high school and they were starting the team, he was, he was you know, piddling around with the idea of playing football another year. But the soccer coach saw how fast he was. And so he put him as a striker. Mayor Wilson didn't know anything about being a striker. <laughs> and the, and the coach just said, "Look, Kurt, this is all I need you to do. We're going to kick the ball down the field. We want you to run onto the ball, grab the ball, and just dribble it towards the goal. If it goes in, once you dribble to the goal, make a shot, dribble around the keeper, whatever you need to do, <laughs> score." And apparently, the story that I've been told is he was a league leading scorer because of his his fast pace and and his his ethic to really see that through. Mm -hmm. um, other council members, me personally, I, um, I, I grew up playing soccer myself okay. in, in a rural town in Selma, Alabama, but Selma, Selma capped out at eighth grade. We mm -hmm. no longer had a soccer program and um, I, I transitioned my soccer skills into playing football and was a place picker for the high school teams there you go. And, and went on to college to pick for UAB. Ah. I, was, I was at University of Alabama from 98 to 2003 as I was always the backup kicker. I never could make that make that jump into the number one guy. There there was always that guy that I could You couldn't get, get Coach over. Brown to sit there and say, hey, put me in? <laughs> Watson, uh, yeah, I was I was pulling on Watson's shirt tail for about <laughs> five years there. But, um, no, the reason I share that with you is because while I was at UAB doing doing football, I met my wife. My wife was on the women's soccer team at UAB, and go. she was there from, I believe it was 2000 to 2003, 2004, somewhere in there. And, um, you know, I, I got a really good appreciation for the women's game after uh, watching her and, and seeing all the things that the women's team do. And, and that's where I, I truly got an appreciation for the toughness that they bring to the game. The women, when when they play the game, they play the game. If they get fouled, they're getting up. 
they're not rolling around making a big Hollywood story out of this asking for a foul. They're well, getting up, unless, they're playing unless you look at the Brazilian team sometimes in, in <laughs> international competition. They're, they're, I, I got the one-liner in. I got the zero. Yeah, you got, there you go. You, you see where I'm going here. But, um, yeah, she she's thrilled. Uh, my, my children are thrilled. Everybody is thrilled. The, uh, the other council members, they, they are just, they're besides themselves seeing this come through because when this first idea came, came about, you know, it's, it's, it's one of these, not necessarily crazy ideas, but it's one of these ideas that, that we're looking at and saying, will this work? Can this work? And as, as we've put the efforts into it and it has become known that, yeah, this would not only work, but this would, this would set Roswell apart. This would put us on the map as as being the preeminent program, and that and the rest is history. Just if everybody's excited now, just wait to see what comes. And uh, I know that in other projects inside USL, eight thousand seat facilities, uh, the Colorado Springs facility, I think, had a a price tag of forty two million dollars. Uh, I don't know if you guys have gotten into the the monetary idea of what the live work play will be and the financing and where the money is going to be coming from and all that kind of stuff. When it comes to the economics of this deal, the yes. city of Roswell is, as of right now, very confident that the LOI that has the, the end of the calendar year attached to it, that the city of Roswell is confident that something will happen inside its city limits involving the USL and this live work play idea. You guys are that confident. Uh, absolutely confident. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, two more questions. And cause I know that you're in your car and you're sitting there going, I'd like to get my Dunkin' Donuts before 10 o'clock. So they don't <laughs> you know, transition to lunch on me. Uh, infrastructure. A and I yep. know that uh, a lot of folks who follow the sport in here in the city and they have issues getting from one part of the planet to the other uh, it seems yep. like construction is perpetual on 285 and getting uh on the correct off ramp to get off 285 to go up 400 sometimes turns into an adventure on a daily basis when it comes to attracting folks from outside the city of roswell proper within the city limits that isn't milton or sandy springs or alpharetta or duluth or uh, East Cobb to get to, to this particular arena, uh, to get to this particular arena. Marta only goes so far up the North line. It gets you to North Springs. You're still, you know, five miles shy, I think, of Holcomb Bridge Road. Right. When it comes to the infrastructure and all of the roads issues that you would anticipate in the build and, and access, I, I guess when it comes to the infrastructure element of this, what is the city anticipating when it comes to the other efforts that have to be made to make this project go and make sure that, you know, you don't have folks on a two lane road trying to look like they're going to a rock concert or something. And you've got like nine, nine hours worth of traffic. How does the city feel about addressing this particular element of it? And, and that's a, a really good question. And, and with, with such a, a large project coming through, that is one of the things that, that needs to be addressed some of the the numbers that you were putting forward when it comes to state route this and, and us highway that roswell only has uh, purview over certain things and mm -hmm. that is roswell specific streets all the numbers that you just named off were either national or state uh, state roads got it so this is going to be a partnership we are absolutely going to have to work through the the ins and the outs with the partnership with the state of georgia department mm -hmm. of transportation as well as federal if there's any kind of federal that needs to be done but um that's that's where we're, we're coming into we're under the due diligence piece right now with the letter of intent yes letter of intent's been done now it's up to us to work with our community partners such as georgia department of transportation to put the roadmap together to to help help the the traffic concerns of, of what you're alluding to because as as you were starting to talk about the traffic i just started getting flashbacks <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I understand that one i understand that one i understand that one no no question about it but yeah we're not we're not going to be building this and just putting it somewhere and say okay here it is we've got to do the traffic studies we've got to do the traffic uh diligent due diligence on this piece and it is it is going to be a community effort when it comes to Georgia Department of Transportation, Fulton County, uh, as well as if there's any kind of federal in there as well. 
And my last question for you, and thanks for for putting up with us, especially on short notice. Uh, when it comes to to do lists, and this is what I ask of prospective owners and first year owners of franchises when they come on the show, we all have have our to do list, and I know that you and everyone that is attached to the city of Roswell, you have your to do list when it comes to this project to make sure that it turns into a successful build. You end up with both franchises and can have this relationship with the USL. We all have them. It could be in a Google Doc. It could be in, you know, it could be on a calendar like we got from the banks when we were growing up, you know, the big bank calendar that's got all the Certainly. dates on it and you have, you know, the you know, arrows and everything. Or it could be on a big dry erase board inside the city hall of Roswell in a room that has the lights out that only certain folks can see, kind of like the ACC deed of gift. You need special permission to go into this room and, and write something down on this list. <laughs> where is this to-do list for the city of Roswell? And where? what do you think the next thing that the city of Roswell can check off of this to-do list as you get to the end of the letter of intent deadline at the uh, on New Year's Eve? Okay, so where's the to-do list? And where is written, the to-do list? And what is the next thing that we have on our to-do list? Is, that, is that the that, question? That you can check off and say, okay, we can knock this out. We're done. Let's go on to the next thing. So, yeah, where is the big to-do list? And what is the next thing that the city of Roswell thinks it can check off as you get closer and closer to New Year's Eve and the end of the initial deadline for the letter of intent with the USL? You know, and I'm... As I've been coming and going through the meetings, uh, either virtually or, or in person, the the to do list, I honestly I don't know necessarily where the to do list is located. I'm not I'm not aware of there being a dry erase board. I'm not aware of there being a floating around Google document. I just this has been very much of a conversational piece as as I've been involved right now. Um, you know, sure, there's there's going to be something that's out there when it comes to this is the next step. And I, I would feel pretty confident here soon that, that we're going to be releasing our vision and, and where the next steps need to be. That that glorified big board, I, I'm not aware of it. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> just, not in the basement of City Hall where, where Mayor Miller has a key and he sits there and it's like, okay, here's the magic key card. You know, it's like the, the golden ticket. You sit there and go, okay, here's the key card. Here's the door. Go in here. You can turn the lights and you end up with like five spotlights on this big six foot by eight foot whiteboard. I didn't know. You something know it, it'd be interesting if we had that, but no, I'm not aware of that. Um, <laughs> Uh, next, next things that we're going to address, and and what is our next uh, checkoff mark would be, mm -hmm. you know, I would say at this point with with this letter of intent that's going out, we're going to start listening uh, from from the city's perspective. I can't say anything about the USL because the USL right. is doing their own thing, but from the city's perspective, the next thing we're going to be doing is listening to our residents mm -hmm. and understanding what their their concerns would be, understanding their excitement level you know, really gaining and gathering that feedback from the city's perspective as we are here 16 and a half hours into this announcement. I would say that would be our next thing on our list is is really working with our residents to to make sure that they understand all the economic benefits that potentially could come from from this live work play, as well as, you know, putting putting a, a women's and men's soccer team on the map here in Roswell. This is going to be a fantastic, fantastic thing that's going to to continue to leverage our long term economic development plans for for this area. No so doubt that would that would be the next thing. And we will be keeping an eye on it, Mr. Morthland. Uh, thanks for hanging out with us, especially you know when we rang the bat phone there in the city hall. It's like we'd like to have someone come on the morning show and and break everything down. Thanks for thanks for being a good sport about it and uh, picking up the phone and if there's anything going on obviously we'll be keeping an eye on what's going on here at, at uh, sdh but uh, obviously we'll be reaching out as things continue to grow thanks for hanging out with us here on the morning show absolutely thank you guys so much for having us and and we look forward to doing this again when we have some more to share let's let's plan on that no doubt about it uh open door policy here at sdh mr morthland thanks again thank you all all right that is william morthland he is the mayor pro tem of the city of roswell he is the Post 5 Council member. He is also the liaison to community development and economic development, which makes a lot of sense to have him on to discuss the, the first day, really, with uh, the, conference, the conference yesterday, the press conference yesterday with Justin Papadakis of the USL. 
a guy who grew up in Roswell. And so a horseshoe bend uh, subdivision guy comes to Roswell and it's a live work play idea. How about we do it here? And so now the city of Roswell and the USL have a letter of intent until New Year's Eve. It can be expanded from that point as they try and work their way toward the live work play 10,000 seat expandable to 15,000 should uh, demand make it uh, where they're going to be housing uh, a USL Super League, sorry, Super League franchise and a USL Championship franchise. We did not get into the USL specific issues because these are there are certain questions that are tied to our friends in Tampa. And so uh, uh, Maddie has, uh, you know, Maddie has been banging on doors. Uh, Ma- Maddie has been banging on doors and it's been, uh, it, she's been really uh, picking up the phone trying to see if folks in Tampa can answer uh, with what's been going on. But uh, Maddie Cruz on the ones and twos, let me bring in Maddie. I know that a lot of folks, uh, are excited about this announcement. They are excited about uh, what could be. And that's why I wanted to ask Mr. Morthland the last question. It's like, okay, what's the next thing you think you can check off of this list? So we have until, let's see, we have nine months and four days for this letter of intent before it could be renewed for another nine months. So nine months here takes you to New Year's Eve. We go from here. Maddie, now that you've had the chance to listen to uh, Mr. Morthland, the mayor pro tem of the city of Roswell, what'd you think? Well, I thought it was really interesting that um, that it was USL that approached Roswell, and I yeah. love that. Mm-hmm. I mean, but thinking about um, thinking about the relationship between Justin and and Roswell, you know, that kind of makes sense. Yeah, um, it makes sense why they would do that. Um, it, I mean, I was very excited to hear too that there's a big emphasis on the Super League with the women's yeah. side. I, I that I think is really exciting because I think I think it's great that we're going to have a USL Championship League, but I think it's awesome that we're going to be one of hopefully we're going to be one of the teams to start in the Super League. That's pretty cool. It's yeah. Pretty awesome. Yeah. So if if things come to pass where everyone agrees and as as we did yesterday and we did the we did the detective work on where it could be. And that's why I wanted to specifically ask Mr. Morthland about the notion of, okay, is it inside Roswell proper? Is it in the suburbs? Where is it? And this is the other element morning, Harry. That, that is attached to this. This is an inside the city of Roswell environs kind of deal. And so I know Tom, Tom, uh, Tom Cato yesterday is a part of the detective agency and Abby and everybody that was trying to figure out, okay, where could this go? Where could this go? And I mean, you got to look at space that currently isn't being used. And I know that there's going to be environmental uh, interest, considering where you are in relation to the Chattahoochee River, those kinds of things. And I know that the Roswell River Rats, I think, has already been uh, pr- presupposed as a possible nickname for this club that has yet to exist. But um, the fact that a, a Horseshoe Bend guy came to the city of Roswell and said, hey, I got an idea for live, work, play. And now that you have the uh, I did not know the the football playing past uh, of the mayor in uh, in Huntsville. And the fact that uh, Mr. Morthland was the kicker, uh, one, one of the kickers at UAB. I thought that was interesting, too. So uh, he came from Selma, Alabama. But we know from our time covering high school soccer, we know about the footprint up Georgia 400. And so this is going to be a very, very interesting next couple of months as the city tries to figure out where, we, where can we put this. And I could not let it go without asking the question about infrastructure, because we all know going to venues, not just sports venues, but going to venues these days, sometimes you are stuck in traffic forever. It is two lanes in, two lanes out, and it, it ain't fun. And, and so what would the city of Roswell do? And Mr. Morthland mentioned the cooperation, obviously, that's going to be needed with the major thoroughfares that are attached I don't think anything has to happen to, to uh, Georgia 400. I think you're fine there. Georgia 120 to me will be a, an interesting element in this. Holcomb Bridge Road, the, the main artery that works its way 
uh, in, or, in and around uh, Roswell proper. You get off at Holcomb Bridge Road at that exit, and you build out Georgia 120, this is where the DOT comes into play. We want to do something here. What do we need to do? Then you've got to get the roads figured out and all that kind of stuff. So it, it is going to be a task on, on multiple fronts for the city of Roswell, but we thought it would be uh, important to at least get the Roswell perspective before we can reach out to folks in Tampa. And if we can grab Justin, that'd be fantastic. But I have the impression that Justin's phone is probably blowing up just as much. So um, once again, thanks to the city of Roswell for uh, coordinating that with us. And, uh, you know, Maddie sent, I think, 9,000 emails and called them like 38 times. And they were like, OK, we'll finally get somebody on the air with you. So. Once again, thanks to Mr. Morthlin, thanks to the city of Roswell, and that is your your day after update with everything going on in Roswell. What's on your mind, Maddie? Well, big news. Um, not big news, but uh, Doug Robertson just tweeted and reported um, ticket sales for the She Believes Cup in Atlanta is now past 39K. Okay, so that's the number. That, that's the number that uh, would set it right even with the the modern-day record when it comes to a, a, a standalone event like that. So right now you're at 39,000. So you're at 39,000 tickets. So 39,000 with the She Believes Cup. That means that you are getting close. They've opened the upper deck and they've opened the 300s. So you imagine that walk up will take you north of 40,000 already. You've got until April 6th, so you're looking at 10 days away, week and a half from now. Roster came out yesterday. We talked about it before we went off the air. But right now, the 300 level is open. Get as many of your butts in there as humanly possible. Go to ussoccer.com slash tickets, ussoccer.com slash tickets. And thanks to US Soccer for being a, a proud sponsor of what we do here on the SDH Network when it comes to our high school matches of the week. Uh, Maddie, before we turn into hour two, what was it like last night with River Ridge and Sequoia? Ooh, it was a fun one. The boys' game was wow. Golasso. Oh wow. I mean, I, I didn't think the game would end. I I it was crazy. Um River Ridge obviously came out on top five to three. Oh wow. Um uh two goals and scored in overtime. Uh it was tied three three at the end of regulation. So then we went into overtime and uh, river ridge came out on top so river ridge is the region champs and now they move on they'll i believe they'll have a break and then they'll have another game i believe against buford and then that's when state championship starts to kick up which is is all very soon it's very exciting yep got a couple of weeks left in the regular season some folks are done with region play and you end up with a couple of non-region matchups to fill your schedule and uh our week it really just got started with uh, that matchup last night. And today, I will be up at Denmark for the doubleheader with Forsyth Central in Denmark. That one, I believe, is 537.30 on the network. If it's 6 and 8, uh, I'll let you know. But I think it's 537.30. Thursday, it is McIntosh at Stars Mill. We'll all be down at Stars Mill for that one. And on Friday, we head to the mountains. And uh, we go to the, our first trip to the mountain region here for broadcasting the SDH Game of the Week presented by our friends at Kaiser Permanente. Kaiser Permanente for all that is you at KP Georgia on the 280 character app. White County and Gilmer County. Looking forward to that one on Friday night. And we all get to catch our breath on Saturday before uh, Sunday and Chicago Fire making their way to the Mercedes-Benz Stadium to take on Atlanta United. And it should be decent weather. So uh, the... The Easter Sunday special involving Chicago and Atlanta. That will uh, that'll be a uh, three forty five kick, I think. Three forty five or three fifty, I think that uh, it's on Big Fox, and they get the super hyper mega uh, pregame show that's attached to it too. So that's why it's at three forty five instead of three forty. Or they might come on the air at three o'clock and or you know eleven thirty. Shoot, I don't know. They could be doing the the really long pregame show, but three forty five is the time that has been floated. And so we will see what's up with uh, with our friends at Land United and uh, the Chicago Fire. We got into that discussion a little bit 
with with Tyler at ATL Pilgrim on the Twitters and at Scarves in Spikes, the letter N Spikes on the on the 280 character app, and they'll go through it all on their live show. You can uh, watch them on the YouTubes as they roll through everything. Actual oh, so they do have the uh, Super Hyper Mega uh, pregame show on Big FOX. It is an actual kickoff. Abby, God bless you. 355. So it is the Super Hyper Mega, super long Big FOX pregame show. Broadcast starts at 3.30, kickoff at 3.55 on Big FOX. That way it carries itself all the way to 6 o'clock, and then you get into the 6 o'clock news at that point. Um, what that traditionally means is uh, that uh, that means that Abe and Garrett, I think, have another 10 or 15 minutes that they have to fill. So uh, remember, hour before, and I guess in this case, an hour and 25 minutes before, Abe and Garrett on 92.9 the game. And then an hour after the match, Abe and Garrett, Mike and Jason. And hopefully we will be having three points to discuss for Atlanta United. Three in the back of the net and maybe more. And three points on the board for Atlanta United as they take on the Chicago Fire. Uh, gates open at two. Okay, yeah. And traditionally, if you're thinking that, uh, uh, you know, because of it, it's not, Fox's fault that you would have things open later in a situation like this. Traditionally, if it's like a 3.30 kick, then 90 minutes before the gates would open, gates are still going to open at 2 o'clock. Right, Abby? 90 minutes ahead of scheduled kickoff, 3.30. So doors open at 2. You can trickle in. You can get your food, get your lunch, and uh, work off a little bit of the Easter candy that you might have gotten in the morning and be ready for the 3.55 kick on Big FOX and on Apple TV+. Plus, So it'll be, and I think it's uh, Steve Cangelosi, Danny Higginbotham. They're going to be calling the match on Sunday on Apple TV. I don't know who's calling it on Big FOX, but we certainly can uh, find out about that. We have not had the chance, and like I said, uh, waiting for the, the busiest man in the Northeast to see if we can uh, spring him away from uh, his uh, his busyness, but he has just let us know. Breaking news. Busy morning. Really crazy. So uh, hour number two on a wall pass Wednesday is all hours. So we get to talk about whatever we want to talk about. But uh, last night, for those of you that might have other, um, how do we phrase this, other teams in your social media, I don't know if you had the chance to look, but there was a delivery we guess, from uh, a particular football club out on the West Coast to a gentleman who is playing in Europe. And so now it appears that the idea of the next 18-month signing for LAFC is going to be Olivier Giroud. Tommy Scoops and Fabrizio Romano were uh, all over this over the last couple of days. And so now... It appears that you you end up with the next 18-month signing for LAFC. You sign Gareth Bale to an 18-month. You sign Giorgio Chiellini to an 18-month deal. And so now it appears, according to both Tom Bogart and Fabrizio Romano, that the man and his hair, the glorious hair of Olivier Giroud, will not will not, I don't think anyway, because I don't know if you want to, uh, I don't know if you wish to disturb the flow that is Olivier Giroud. I don't, I don't know if you want to, uh, I don't know if you want to disturb that flow. But traditionally with LAFC, we always get to see the, the, the hat wearing, uh, the hat wearing deal where the, the new individual that's attached to LAFC Starts with their head down. You see the LAFC hat with the gold wing. They tilt their head up. They're wearing a hat, no matter how awkward the moment is. And you get to see who's new for LAFC. I don't know if we get that moment with Olivier Giroud. You may have attendance off of each shoulder with that hat. And they may just hold it over Olivier Giroud's head. Olivier Giroud and his perfectly quaffed flow and the beard to match may start independent of the lid with his head down. 
he will tilt his head up, the hat being held by two attendants off of each shoulder, will lift the hat appropriately, and they will work with the angle of Olivier Giroux's perfectly coiffed and moosed hair and perfect beard. So the hat will not touch the hair, but it will lift, and you will see the glorious flow of Olivier Giroux coming up in short order. That's what I anticipate. I anticipate that there will be attendants that will be there to, quote, end quote, put the hat on Olivier Giroux. You ain't messing with that hair. You ain't messing with that beard. So Olivier Giroux, it appears, as LAFC is finalizing the agreement is how it's being phrased. Fabrizio Romano, while we were sleeping, verbal agreement to sign Giroux on a contract valid until December of 2025 after interest revealed in October, formal bid earlier this week. Initial agreement is in place. Romano said nothing signed yet, but close to being done. Here we go soon, is how Fabrizio Romano had phrased it. Tommy Scoops said that they were finalizing a deal. Joining LAFC this summer when his contract with AC Milan expires. He would join LAFC after the Euro, which runs through the middle of July. Summer transfer window opens on July 18. So in a perfect world, Olivier Giroud could be done with the Euro and then fly to Los Angeles for his moment in the Southern California sun in the middle of July. Right after the Euros, hey, man, I'm taking a flight. I'm out. The guaranteed portion of the deal, according to Bogert, runs through the 2025 season. Sources add. LAFC has had his discovery rights, meaning they've got the priority to sign him ahead of any other MLS club. The discovery rights thing, that I don't know about that. You ought to just, it's like, look, I'm interested. Shoot. Uh, heck, you know, look, I'd put discovery rights on Kobe Mainu or Erling Holland. Doesn't mean I'm going to get them, but that's what discovery rights, I mean, that's what discovery rights are. You know, it's just, look, if you're interested, go. But I was in line first, rar. Then you have to say the rar when you're making your point. Discovery rights. Okay, fine. Giroux, who is 37, as France's all-time leading scorer, still active with the French national team, just wrapped up international duty this week, appeared in a friendly against Germany. AC Milan, 12-8 and eight in 26 Serie A appearances. He's played 1,850 minutes. Second in Serie A facing Roma in the quarterfinals of the Europa League. So then you would have Denny Buanga, who wanted out, and then LAFC signed him to a new deal. But once again, remember, you're controlling the asset in as much as you're keeping Denny Buanga in-house. Christian Oliveira, Giroux, Buanga. Beat Nashville 5-0 on the weekend. That's another topic coming up in a bit. Bogish, who is a natural center, central midfielder, has been uh, head coach Steve Chirundolo's choice at striker, playing more of a false nine, according to Bogert. Club's two natural options at the position are Tomas Angel and Nathan Ordaz. Since joining Milan from Chelsea back in 21, integral to Milan's success, including winning Serie A's first year, 46 goals in his time in Italy. Everybody knows that his hair has been perfectly coiffed, dating back to his time at Arsenal. Broke through with Montpellier uh, a little over a decade ago. Won Champions League, Europa League with Chelsea. France got to the World Cup final in 18 and 22, beating Croatia in the 18 final, losing to Lionel Messi on penalties in the 22 final. 56 goals and 130 caps for Olivier Giroud internationally. So, it is nearing a deal. Nearing a deal. So that's where we are. Nearing a deal. And we'll see. So, that's the next 18-month signature. It's like uh, LAFC is becoming selectively veteran in their choices it's like literally they'll bring they have the kids that they come up from now ventura county but no sorry that's uh, lag but lafc too you have the nathan ordazes and you've had the academy system work uh coaches 
in Los Angeles uh, don't really put a whole lot of folks from LAFC too on the first team roster, but that's another issue entirely uh, and give them quality minutes. But it seems like the stop gap for John Thorrington to try and chase after titles is that you bring in the international over 35er, sign him to an 18 month deal and see what happens. Chiellini, Bale, and now apparently uh, Olivier Giroud. So, uh, yes, and Alex is reminding us of the jawline of Olivier Giroud as well. Yes, absolutely true. It is It is the hair, the perfectly coiffed hair, the beard, finely manicured, and the jawline. So all three. Uh, uh, our, our, <laughs> Tyler says it'll be a scarf and a pair of sunglasses. Well, but you got to have the beard. You know, maybe if it's a beard drawn on a piece of paper or something. Uh, Dell wants to know if anybody else confuses Giroux and Gignac. Um, I could see it. Just the fact that it's a little bit more easily accessible for me to watch Tuta NA than it is Paramount Plus to watch Serie A versus and our friend Poppy Miller on the desk versus um, Tuta NA to see our buddy Gignac and Tigres. Uh, Son of Stan, we did. Uh, we spoke to the city of Roswell, and that, and what we will do is after the show this morning, we will uh, post the interview with uh, Mayor Pro Tem Morthland on the network, and uh, we'll, we'll post the show as we always do in its entirety. Then what we will do is post the uh, the individual interview itself on the on the app, and so you can listen to it as well. Go to Spreaker.com. It's like the word speaker with an R in the middle. Then download that app. If you haven't downloaded it or if you're an OG, you can go to the Soccer Down Here app on Android. And then you can do a search for Soccer Down Here. Save your search. Download the Spreaker app. And you can listen to all the content when it gets released, whether it's a show in its entirety or a segment like it was with Mayor Pro Tim Morthland. Um, We did. And they have the letter of intent until the end of the calendar year, until New Year's Eve. It can be extended for another nine months after that. They are confident, extremely confident, that they're going to get something done and that they're going to find a space. The USL went to the city of Roswell. USL went to the city of Roswell. And and it does make sense considering the Papadakis uh, previous home address was in one of the subdivisions there attached to a country club in Roswell itself. So uh, Roswell was approached by the USL about this. 10,000 seater. Live, work, play environment like we've seen in League One specifically. Lexington, Chattanooga, Statesboro. And they are going to house a a Super League team. And the USL Championship team is also on the books as well. There are separate questions that I did not ask Mayor Pro Tim Morthland on purpose. Because they are USL questions. When we went over the finances that need to be available, the vetting process, that kind of a thing. Those are USL questions. Those are not the city of Roswell questions. And we will continue to bang on the door of the USL down in Tampa to see if we can have somebody discuss what's going on in Roswell. And if it's Justin Papadakis, that'd be fantastic. So 10,000 seater, expandable to 15, looking at sites inside Roswell proper, city, city limits, not like in Milton where Abby found 40 uh, 40 acres of land available for purchase, but apparently inside the city of Roswell. So that that to me sounds like it's going to be the repurposing of uh, what we were discussing yesterday having to do with with businesses and since we no longer call them strip malls. So I would probably venture to say uh, one or two mall sites when he said, I have one in mind and I want to see, I'm holding mine internally and I want to see if what I think matches one of the site ideas that the city of Roswell and the USL think. But 10,000 seater, expandable to 15. The priority is for the Super League franchise, the Super League franchise, USLS, USL Championship on the books as well. But they're excited to have this 10,000 seat facility engaged with a USLS franchise. So infrastructure is a, pro- is, a, is a problem that has to be addressed. Mr. Morthland did say that they're going to have to uh, have conversations both with the State Department of Transportation and the, the big Department of Transportation in Washington, D.C., specifically if there are roads involved that are either 
federal or state thoroughfares that are attached to the site involving the road because traffic in that part of the country ain't all that great to begin with, especially during rush hours. And if you have a 10,000-seat stadium where you probably have to have just as many parking spaces or 7,500 parking spaces nearby and access in and out, and you're trying to get two you folks to get to your building for a 7 or a 7.30 kick on a weeknight, that's hell on the roads. So you got to work on infrastructure. Marta Line, the public transportation, is still five, is five miles short of Georgia 120. What are you going to do with fans there? I would imagine it's going to be some kind of a shuttle bus system. Or it might be, you know, uh, do that in Uber, work your way around, and uh, figure that out. But to me, where are you building it? Where's the money coming from to build it? How much investment is the city going to have in this once they announce the site? Is the city going to have bonds? Is the city going to boost millage rates? Is they're going to put a tax on uh, associated events in the venue? Is it going to be a combination of all three? Is it something else we haven't thought of? Those kinds of things. Those are City of Roswell questions. And like I said, we've got an open door policy with the City of Roswell. Mayor Miller, Pro- Mayor Pro Tem Morthland, they want to come on. We'll talk about it. But right now, 10,000 seater, they're really jacked about it. And they're looking forward to seeing uh, the next stages in there. Uh, is it going to be both women's and men's teams from the jump? That is the question. Uh, that is one of the questions because, uh, Tom, we talked about it yesterday. And it's important to continue to remember these kinds of things. The U.S. Soccer Federation has specific bylaws when it comes to owners who want to own franchises in first and second division uh, sanctionings, to create a word, here in the United States. For the first division, the USLS, the, the Women's League, the ownership group has to have a total net worth of $25 million. Doesn't matter what level, doesn't matter if it's men's or women's, Division One, you've got to come to the table with a net worth of $25 million as an ownership group. If you are the lead owner and you have, if I remember correctly, you as the lead owner, let's say, Tom, you're the lead owner, and you have to have at least 35% of the 100, if you're the guy at the top of the pyramid, of the ownership group of Airborne DJFC, then you, sir, have to have a net worth of $15 million. You have to show proof of this to the U.S. Soccer Federation and to, I would imagine, the, the league that is in charge of that first division club. Your whole ownership group for a first division club Attached to the U.S. Soccer Federation, $25 million net worth, and you got to show it. Second division is $20 million net worth for the entire ownership group, and I think it's 10 for 35%. So women's division, first division sanctioning, $25 million net worth of the entire ownership group. Majority owner has to have at least 35% and has to be worth at least 15 Second division, $20 million across the board for all the ownership groups. Once again, 35% for majority owner, and I think it's 10. What this, what this means, as Maddie does the Irish goodbye, and we will catch up with Maddie again tomorrow. What this means is that both are currently planned for the city of Roswell. That is the plan as of right now. And I don't know, and like I said, this is a question for the USL, if not the U.S. Soccer Federation. But I don't know if it means that if you want both in the same building and it's one owner, and there is money north of Georgia 400 in that part of the planet, 
So that they're the the economic in, the individuals that could handle the economics are there. But what I don't know, and like I said, this is a question for both the USL and the US Soccer Federation. If you have an owner interested in multiple clubs in multiple divisions, does that mean that you have to pony up the entire thing, 25 plus 20? Do you have to pony up 45 million and sit there, I'm worth $45 million? I want to have both the Super League, the USLS team, and the USL Championship team. Or can you go to the U.S. Soccer Federation and or the league that you're interested in and go, hey, I'm good for the big number, CCC, and then you get the other one. You got to be, you got to sign a letter of intent saying that you are going to be there for at least three seasons, and you have to give a, a, a surety bond. I think it's a six-figure, if, if I remember correctly. So that is the larger question here. Other than the USL, the USL coming to the city of Roswell, seeing a live work play opportunity like they have in other markets in USL League One, I get it. Okay, cool, fine. But what I don't know is if you if you have one owner wanting both franchises, if you're responsible for the entire dollar figure, 25 plus 20, or if you're good, if you're good on the larger one, do they sit there and say, yeah, okay, cool, go ahead and uh, the uh, second division team. You're good on it. We don't know that. I don't know, but that's the other thing we don't know. We don't know if it would be separate owners for separate clubs in the same building. That would sound a little odd, but that's that. That to me is the larger question from the USL perspective and the US Soccer Federation perspective. Don't know if it's both of these from jump. That is the intent, but you don't know right now if it's one owner, if you're responsible for the full $45 million net worth or not. So that's the larger question. So keep an eye on that when it comes to our conversations with the USL and keeping an eye on the letter of intent in the city of Roswell and building this the, the live, work, play 10,000-seat stadium that is going to be Division I uh, priority first. Or at least that, that if, you, if they had to choose one or the other, it sounds like that they would be choosing the first division women's team in the 10,000-seat facility and we did the math yesterday, Widener Field, Colorado Springs, as a comparative example, was three years ago at the cost of $42 million. So building the facility, you're probably thinking somewhere in the neighborhood of 60. Then live, work, play, you're probably, let's say it's a $100 million investment. And you've got to come up with, say, 40 acres. 40 acres, $100 million, plus the infrastructure bill, Plus the property and the property renovation, whether you're knocking down trees or tearing down buildings, you're probably talking 200 million by the time everything is up and running and everybody's in the door. That does not include anything involving the club. So you're probably looking at a 200 to 250 million dollar investment from both the city and from the USL on this live work play uh, element that is in the city of Roswell planned in short order. And we'll see where it goes. But no, thanks to once again the city of Roswell for hanging out with us and letting us know with uh, what uh, is going on uh, the day after a big press conference involving the USL in the city of Roswell. Uh, yeah, Dale is out because twenty-five million is too much, and Tom's like when he wins Powerball tonight, he's in. You and me both. Abby reminds us an inter or intra. I think it would be intra intra supporters group egg hunt. Meet at the Footy Mob DJ at noon. It's open to all ages. Very cool. Uh, all right. So now that we've gotten to 1025, let me say hi to everybody who has uh, made it in this morning. Morning, Alex. Morning, Abby. Morning, Ricky. Uh, morning, Tom. And morning, Pars. Pars says, does anyone else notice Gigi's physically smaller this season than he was when he came here? Well, I, I, I haven't. He still seems like a He still seems like an 18-wheel Mack truck to me. Uh, but I will now. Now I will pay uh, more attention. Uh, morning, Nile, and morning, Tom. Yes, exotic retail spaces. We have to keep an eye on the exotic retail spaces. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, Abby, six point nine miles downtown Roswell to North Springs could be, but I don't think it would be downtown Roswell. You, I, in our in our looking at the atlas yesterday, 
the notion of it being something where, all right, you got to have space to do it. You've got to have geography willing to, to seat it. That's why I think it has to be rehabilitated space. It won't be anything new. Uh, the site I have in mind has uh, exotic retail space on both sides of a major thoroughfare. And I think you could do parking or uh, the live aspect on one side of the road and the uh, stadium and possibly parking and the uh, live. So it would be like the work and the parking structure on one side of the road of the major thoroughfare, the play and live on the other side. So you're like I say, you're probably looking 40 or 50 acres. But I, th- but the spot that I have in mind, I'd have to go up and drive around now in the city of Roswell to look. But I think it would be on both sides of a major thoroughfare. You have the stadium on one side, the parking on the other, the living on one side, the working on the other. So it would be like both sides of a major thoroughfare. That's just what was triggering in my head as I was asking the question this morning. Uh, 4.8 miles to a golf course. Maybe that's going away. So once again, look at and what uh, Mr. Morthland said. They have to work with their partners in transportation. Anything that's Georgia whatever, anything that's U.S. whatever. Like Roswell Road is a U.S. designated highway. Holcomb Bridge Road is a Georgia designated highway. Whatever road you attach to, you've got to attach yourself to conversations with that particular Department of Transportation. I imagine the conversations will be more with the Georgia DOT in widening roads and causing travel headaches during construction than anything else. Uh, Obviously, Tyler's jacked about it, as are our buddies at Scarves and Spikes. Um, Shuttles, my guess is, is that there might be shuttles early on, shuttles and Ubers, but try to get as close to the, the joint as possible. Um, yes. And so that once again, the subtle plug, uh, after, uh, our friends that, uh, she believes are done with the double header, you can walk across the Home Depot backyard, go hang out with our buddies at Scarves and Spikes Insignia and have a watch along for Atlanta United. So, uh, Macintosh and Stars Mill, always fiery. Yes. Looking forward to that one tomorrow, both sides. I think it's six and eight and, uh, Maddie, Jason, and I will all be down there for that one. Um, I, I can't do peeps. Abby's talking about peeps as an Easter candy. Uh, the boss has made actual candles with peeps as garnish. Since we can't eat the peeps, and especially if they do the non-traditional colors. I mean, it's it's sugary enough as it is. But if you go outside the Easter colors and then they do like flavoring inside the, the marshmallow, it, just, it gets out of control. So, yeah. Uh, Abby's like, holiday's not until later in April. She can eat peeps this year. Um, let's see. So, uh, uh, I heard Dell about the Miss PK from Yakamakis. I heard about it. That meant that Georgia advanced. And that goes to the question we had now in number one, does Saba now get recalled for the Euros? We'll find out. And Tom, once again, downtown Roswell's too far from 400. Got to think it would be very close to 400. That, that would be my guess. And that's why I I'm staring at a particular, section of a major thoroughfare in Roswell. And remember, this is, as Mr. Morthland said, within the city limits of Roswell. This is not like we had, uh, you know, columbo yesterday and found the 400 acres. And uh, Tom, Tom says there are a couple of very underutilized strip malls in the 400 Holcomb Bridge area, putting my money there. I will neither confirm nor deny that that was my thought as well. So when they come up with the ideas, the city of Roswell, let's see if uh, along those stretches of, of 400, Georgia 400 and Georgia 120, if that is in fact the case. But I will neither confirm nor deny that uh, that was also in my thought pattern. So that's uh, that's where we are. Uh, we got to talk about stuff. And um, no, I'm not talking about what happened in the Colin Miller piece where he's talking to Messi about retirement. We're not going there. But what I did want to do was roll the calendar back, uh, roll the uh, roll our 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 tote board back to zero. And I'm always a bit squeamish about doing this kind of stuff. 
But the reason that I do it is so we're all aware of it. And when stuff like this happens in the future, we address it the right way. We're taking the uh, we're taking the board attached to stupidity down here and rolling it back to zero. Number of days since our last stupid moment. And like I said, in, in these situations when we do stupidity down here and it's attached to a particular individual, this particular individual, although I know that he, this individual does it to get attention, that for whatever reason he feels starved of it in the first place, so he feels compelled to say things that are completely and totally outlandish and tries to make a point, then he becomes a lightning rod, and then he defends his position, no matter how illogically or stupidly it's defended, he'll defend his position, no matter how idiotic the point of view is. But to bring these individuals once again into the sunlight, to me, is the only way that we can stay vigilant against stupidity down here. And I'm just going to go ahead and induct this individual into the Hall of Stupidity here at SDH. And it's Joey Barton. I know that that is no surprise. Joey Barton likes to use his social media as a megaphone, no matter how illogical his point of view is, no matter how sexist his point of view is, no matter how demeaning his point of view is, no matter how out of touch his point of view is, Joey Barton is a lightning rod, and I think he enjoys it. Because that's the only way he's getting attention these days because of his lack of success as a manager and that one of the moments that is indelibly marked with his playing career was the double card when he was at QPR when he took down Aguero, need him from behind, created a problem for QPR. And Manchester City on the uh, Martin Tyler Aguero would eventually win the Premier League on one of the most exciting days in the history of that league. So Joey Barton as a player, I think if you ask about Joey Barton the player, that's the moment he's attached to. Joey Barton the manager, just generally unsuccessful in the position. Joey Barton, the pundit. Joey Barton, the 280-character app typer. Lightning Rod, I think he enjoys it. Let's see what I can do today to set people off. How much of it he believes, I don't know. Is he doing it just to get a rise out of folks? He's doing that because I'm talking about him today. But his points of view are ludicrous. They are out of touch. And the only way to stay vigilant against idiots like this is to continue to make points about idiots like this. That's why Joey Barton is our first inductee into the SDH Hall of Stupidity. So, comma, you ask, comma, what did he do this time? From our friends at The Telegraph, Joey Barton has been branded a bully. and condemned for firing, quote, end quote, horrible online criticism at a 17-year-old female goalkeeper, 17-year-old Partick Thistle goalkeeper, Ava Easton. So, what happened this time? He mocked a 17-year-old teenage keeper on the 280 character app, shared a clip of a goal the youngster let in against Rangers. Barton reposted the video. Once again, this is from our friends at the Telegraph. So this is uh, their wording, Tom Gary, the women's football reporter. Reposted the video and said, quote, I mean, let's just talk about the goalie exclamation point. How is this nonsense on the box? Question mark, close quote. Easton's father who is a seven-time world kickboxing champ 
and presumably someone that you don't want to mess with within closed quarters. Accused Barton of trying to, quote, belittle and bully, end quote, his daughter, while Scotland women's national team head coach Pedro Martinez Losa has been among those to show support for Easton. Scotland and Rangers player Nicola Doherty on the 280 character app. Couldn't help but notice the tweets from an older man regarding this great young goalkeeper who's inspiring the next generation. Keep doing what you're doing. If women's football isn't for you, change the channel. It isn't hard, end quote. Nicola Doherty is spot on. Easton's father. In 2024, and grown men, the word grown in quotes, feel the need to belittle and bully a 17-year-old school kid who doesn't get paid to play, unlike some men who make the same mistake week after week and get paid hundreds of thousands of pounds, end quote. Losa. She's a young player who's competing excellently this season for her club. If we want players like her to develop and play in the national team, we have to create a safe environment where they're going to play and make mistakes. I want to show my support to a player who is playing exceptionally. She's very brave to compete in the final. And by the way, she's playing very well, end quote. Aaron Cuthbert, Chelsea and Scotland midfielder. Ava's a terrific young keeper coming through the Scotland ranks. One mistake won't define you. Mistakes happen. It's a part of football. Morning, Jarrett. Morning, John. Uh, Rachel Corsi came in in defense to the accusation of bullying. Barton responded on social media by saying, yep, there's me bullying a 17-year-old woman by posting a clip of her playing football. The victim playing of these people is beyond pathetic. You're on the sign up to come listen to Joey Barton and gab his damn mouth open. Uh, Why he can't shut the hell up. Yeah, you're on the telly, love. You don't know where your goal is. You basically allow a free shot to go in. Nonsense football off the telly, end quote. So, yeah, no. Uh, I did. Someone I, tell I, Joey Barton the hard, like, doing the hard right punditry lean into thing doesn't work as well as it does here. Also, the shelf life isn't that good. Mm-mm. So, yeah, that was the the most recent Joey Barton outburst. And we've reset the clock to we've reset the uh, the board to zero when it comes to days since stupidity down here happened. But you see something like that with Joey Barton, and I know that part of this... I just walk on by. Right, but at at the same time, I think that we have to expose this stupidity for what it is, as much as we get riled up about it, to continue to be vigilant so we don't become numb to it. Because then if we all become numb to it, then sadly folks you know feel like this is an accepted behavior and joey barton to me is a piece of trash yeah it's it's a tightrope act though because i don't want to give it too much attention i'd rather suffocate it like a fire and yeah get the oxygen out of the room on it just because i could really give a damn about joey barton right. um it's it's kind of a tightrope act though because i don't want to give it too much attention even if it's to call it out and to criticize it just because yeah it just sucks and at this point like Joey Barton's doing things at this point where whether or not he actually believes them is, right. is kind of irrelevant because at this point it feels like it's a caricature and a, and a, and a, and a performance art right. more so than his genuine, genuine beliefs in how he feels about, you know, the entire situation. I just do not care about Joey Barton. I just, God, mm-hmm. I know I got better things to worry about. Um, you know, then Joey Barton spouting off about women's soccer because he wants to decide to take, you know, MRA takes. Yeah. Whatever, man. I, yeah. I don't really care. I'm, man, I'm sorry your career ended like it did, and I'm sorry about your weird dick, Joey. Yes. <laughs> There's the explicit rating for the morning. Uh, yesterday, because I'm an idiot, um, I didn't send you the link to the show. And I thought I did. Uh, Abby? Finish your online course for, a, yes, a car insurance discount. I hope that happens. I hope you get an A and get a discount on your car insurance. Uh, I thought I sent the show link to you yesterday. I didn't because I'm a moron in a hotel room. And I have not had the chance to talk to you about two things. One, the follow-up that we had this morning with the mayor pro tem of the city of Roswell with the USL and I'm guessing their chief real estate officer, Justin Papadakis if not associated individuals, coming to the city of Roswell and saying, hey, we think this would be a good location for a live, work, play 10,000-seater 
that could uh, host USLS and USL Championship. And having the Mayor Pro Tem on this morning, we got uh, that piece of information that the USL came to Roswell. And so we have a letter of intent between the USL and the city of Roswell until a New Year's Eve that can be expanded for uh, another nine months after that. But nine months are now on the clock for Roswell and the USL to try and find a home for a 10,000-seater, expandable to 15, and a new live-work-play environment like we've been seeing in a handful of other markets. Uh, John, have you? Uh, when's the last time you went to Alpharetta? Oh, I go there fairly frequently because that's where oh, that's some right, of our yeah. fans are and high school football and all that stuff. Um, the avenues is what comes to mind. It's like, are y'all going to try and build the avenues with a 10,000-seater in it? Um, it, it, I, I also caution it's like it, this would be very exciting um the entire thing would be it'd be very interesting if you put a second division team here uh in a market that you know would be really fun to have a second division team here along with atlanta united and along with you know numerous npsl teams around the area apotheos continuing to grow now on the northeast side even though they were on the northwest side yeah it, it's it, it's gonna be a long process though so it's exciting but I, I just want people to not get too far over their skis. I also I don't want to blow out their birthday candle for them and tell them the party's over. But I just want people to like be realistic about how time works. <laughs> because yes, when you're doing stadiums, when you're doing these exploratory things, it can be a slow process. And that's okay. It doesn't mean everything's a failure. It's the same thing right now going on um, with the situation up in off Windward McFarland, up and coming with the uh, the gathering. Yes. And that is one step closer to uh, allegedly coming to the fore because it was voted 4-1 on the approval. But what we don't know... Yeah, and uh, so the, and the, the other element in this involving the gentleman that wants to build said gathering is that my interpretation of his point of view the entire time has been get me the expansion franchise in the National Hockey League, then I'll build the building, as opposed to me thinking that that's not really how this works when it comes to a facility? Yeah. Man, Am I wrong? Like, it, no, it's because my understanding with the gathering one is like uh, they're going to try and build this thing but unless an NHL team comes, mm -hmm. it's not gonna it's not gonna pull. You're not gonna use public money. Mm. Um, which I don't know, man. You want it, build it. Yeah, on and your own without yeah. public money. Yeah, um, that's the other element money for something yeah. else. Yeah, yeah, like roads, <laughs> um, public services. So yeah, I mean, I just I, I like I said, I don't want to don't want to blow out people's candles and tell them the party's over. Right, but. Just, just understand that it's a long process. It yeah. would be very cool to have a USL team here. It'd be very cool to have a women's team here. Like, and I say here, you have the Cherokee Impact playing. Uh, yeah, WPSL. Yeah, yeah WPSL, you, you, got, but... you got Decatur FC playing in the WPSL this year. Yes, so you have those. If you're wanting like a bigger team with like a bigger footprint. Um, possibly bigger media rights like that would be very cool just don't get so far over your skis about it and just kind of be excited for what it is right now and let let the timeline take its course yeah we got nine months on this letter of intent in catching up with the mayor pro tem this morning he said that the city of roswell is very confident that something is going to happen and the uh, let's see. So Tom says the best thing I've heard about that that is that there apparently is a thirty year non relo clause uh, attached to uh, the gathering as well and the and national uh, hockey league team. Every I, I wish they all put those in, Tom. Like every time someone gets a new publicly funded stadium, you should put a fifty year clause in. Of you cannot leave. Mm -hmm. Like you can't if if you if you want to leave, it requires a mutual option where we are also kicking you out and you're choosing to leave. Um, it should require that. Yeah, because that way you don't get a stadium, and then 15 years later, you know, someone starts jumping around like a fire ants in their shoes, wanting a new stadium and threatening to move to God knows, I, I don't know where you would move. Like Arizona Coyotes. Now. Arizona Coyotes. <laughs> well, I I don't know where you would move, like an NFL team now, because LA was the threat for so long. Then Vegas was the threat. Would it be yeah. St. Louis? San Antonio. Or, 
Yeah, Tom Benson did float that. Everybody still loves to like. St. Louis still loves to talk about the whole Saints thing, but Tom Benson yeah. did float moving the Saints to uh, San Antonio. And he played there during the Katrina rebuild. So I would oh, say yes. Saint- uh, Alex is correct. I was wrong. It's the Avalon, not the Avenues. Thank right. you, Alex. Uh, uh, so I would say Avalon, St. Louis. St. Louis know. and San Antonio would be the two that I would think of. But yeah. So you're you're staring at all of that. Uh, like I said, Roswell is excited, but I had to ask the mayor pro tem about infrastructure. And uh, we all know what travel's like uh, up in that section of 400 and Holcomb Bridge Road. It, it ain't it ain't free sailing. And one of the things that the Department of Transportation has never been good at is learning from folks like Caltrans about sinking red lights. Caltrans is amazing at sinking traffic lights. So everything flows smoothly for miles at a time. GDOT has never done that. You know what you could also do is um, this would require a lot of money. Uh-oh. You could expand MARTA to take it up like past Mansell. Yeah, and, and that's uh, that's also a part of this. When you're uh, five miles short right now of Holcomb Bridge Road with North Springs. So... Uh, yeah, if if, uh, if Marta wanted to do something like that, then that would help out from the infrastructure uh, discussion as well. I got a couple. I got a side in mind, and we'll see if as we continue to go here. Once again, yesterday, two o'clock, Mayor of Roswell, Justin Papadakis, the Chief Real Estate Officer, Deputy CEO of the USL, they had a press conference, and we got to talk to the Mayor Pro Tem this morning. Everyone's optimistic. Of course, you are. You know, sixteen hours oh, after. Yeah. It's exciting. It's a very exciting concept. I mm-hmm. would love for it to happen. Yep. I just want people to not, not even be negative about it or positive. I just want people to be realistic that like, it's going to take a while. We're going to, you're going to get ups and downs. You're going to get reports that sound glowing. You're going to get reports that sound like this whole thing might collapse in the next day. Mm-hmm. Neither one of them probably going to be true in that moment. Yeah. So just take your time with it. Be yeah. patient with it. It's going to be okay. Every, just, it, just take it, it, it as we sit there. We will analyze it journalistically a day at a time, and we'll sit there. We're not going to we're not going to get over our skis, but what we wanted to do is have folks as educated as possible Absolutely. going into this process so we know what we're looking at and what uh, those of us who are here in the, the broadcast footprint know what to expect when it comes to the possibility of USL building another live, work, play environment like we've seen a lot in USL League One. If you um, need to, go to Costco. They've got giant-ass Squishmallows. Just go get yourself a giant Squishmallow if you need something to squeeze wow. while you're going through all this and you just need something to hang on to. Go do that. Okay. It's healthy. It's fine. Take care of you. Self-care yeah. is important. Yes, self-care is definitely important. Uh, number two number two topic I didn't get the chance to talk to you about yesterday is the uh, tentative agreement in place between PSRA and PRO. Looks like it's a seven-year deal. And uh, it looks like we might have uh, pro folks on the fields this weekend. And we went through the numbers. Pablo Maurer did a, a deep dive and got the, the numbers on the specifics. Uh, folks are getting paid a lot more money. It's not the 90% that, that they were looking at. It's like 5 to 10%. No, 90. About 15 to 20. 90. No, it's, it's not quite 90, but you do get uh, – monetary increases for VAR and, and, and AVARs and things like that and, and ARs that are, uh, you know, $1,500 a game and that stuff does matter. There were a couple of concerns about it that I had yesterday and we'll look at those as this gets ratified and we go forward. But now that we have a deal in place, apparently we get to see the the pro folks and we get to say goodbye to folks like, uh, CCH and some folks that we've seen in lower divisions here, whether it's uh, USL Championship, MLS Next Pro. We, we've seen some folks that we recognize. We got to see some folks that we didn't recognize that turned into something of a cult hero, but it looks like we're getting the pro guys back. Yeah, it's good. Um, you want to get those guys back in. You've got a deal in place now. Now you can proceed. Um, feel free to criticize them when they do their job incorrectly because they will. They have in the past. Um, operating in this black and white world of you know good versus bad with replacement refs versus standard refs it is and was kind of weird. Mm-hmm. Um, still to me personally. Yeah. But yeah, you you got them back in. Now hopefully everything can just kind of proceed as normal. <laughs> 
let's see what I, what I want to see is what happens to the people who were the replacement officials because a lot of those people were real officials. Mm-hmm. They just weren't contracted with uh, PRS, PSRA. Um, but there's still officials who do jobs all around the country and at different levels. And of course, they would love to work their way up to being a part. Uh oh. He was right at making his point. There we go. All right. Wait. Hang on. Go back to your original point because your Bluetooth is. Uh, yeah. So, there we go. Okay. Yeah. Now go back, so, to, go back to your restart. Yeah. So I guess my whole thing with this being trying to figure out imagine putting yourself in their shoes where you're not a part of Pro mm. or PSRA. Yeah. But you have a chance to do big games and get some, get your name out there, get some recognition, try and do your job well mm. so that you can progress in your career. Because, look, whether we want to talk about it or not, in every aspect of your life, every aspect of your career, there's going to be politics along the way. Yep. Being an official is no different. There's absolutely politics involved here. Don't kid yourself. Yep. So hopefully they're not completely blacklisted because it's not like you just pulled people off the street to officiate games. Right. They were officials. They were trained. They were asked to do a, They were asked to do this job because games had to go. Yeah, they did. Hopefully, their careers are not completely uh, put in a ditch by all of this. And, and that see. that to, well, and that to me is one of the the questions that I have is: Did Pro insulate themselves in this? negotiation and with this agreement so basically everyone that is attached to pro that is either a center f an avar of uh i mean a an ar a fourth a var an avar is everyone inside that umbrella locked in place where the glass ceiling that folks are banging themselves on that we got to see in the first five match days are they just going to be banging on that door from the, the floor below and no one's going to answer? And it's going to take a retirement or a reassignment to open up a spot for an individual who wants to be a part of the reindeer games. But did this agreement basically lock that door and the folks that we are used to seeing on match days in Major League Soccer, is that who we have? That, to me, is a, a big question here. It is. And they'll know um, uh, Jarrett stepped out of his office to yell about things for a minute <laughs> for therapeutic reasons. There you go. With a pair of Gen 1 AirPods that do not hold a charge worth Ooh. a damn. So uh. they are they're quickly dying. Okay. <laughs> I'm on nice. the second one. Um, eh, it's fine. Uh, yeah. It, how, how, how I want to see what happens to those officials who were the replacement refs mm-hmm. because it was a unique situation for them. It's a tough situation because you had to weigh the the good and the bad of making that decision to do those games that had to get done. Um, hopefully, uh, in, in all that he said, she said, there was yeah. the report that like Chris Penso was like pretty much threatening them. <laughs> he was yeah, he's them like blacklisted. allegedly he goes over to the hotel where the replacement officials are staying and is trying to confront them at the front door. Um, hopefully they're not completely blacklisted and they can work their way up. Um, just because, it's, like I said, it's a unique situation. It's not like you grabbed a bunch of people off the street, put them in uniforms, and told them to go do the job. Yeah. Um, how they progress will be interesting. How the relationship progresses with PSRA um, and Pro and the league and the players, how that all happens, because the, the deal is a very long one. Yeah. We'll see how it goes. Um, hopefully, though, it's stable. Hopefully, education continues with officials and you get more and better officials as it goes. And I guess the thing is there, you have to balance, though. Of like, we need better officials. We need more of them. Okay, but the more you get, the fewer assignments there are. Right. Repeat assignments for people. And when you're getting paid by the game, you're going to yes. want to... Hang on to yours. Yeah, you're going to want to hang on to your assignment. So you don't want the pool to get too large even if it's a little bit larger see there there is a bit of needle threading here Mm -hmm. but i'm glad they got it done i'm glad you have the officials that you're comfortable with who have done this before who have those relationships with players back in because i think that's one of the big things we saw 
was so many of the officials were either way too confrontational, the, yeah. the replacement officials, or <laughs> or Jarrett's second round of iPods die. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but but it, they either were uh, not negotiating and not talking enough or talking or being too confrontational and like not right. knowing that line. But now you have officials who are more accustomed to the players that are there, mm. accustomed to having those conversations with the players and communicating. And I think it will make for a better flow of things. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. Who's the um, yes. Uh, and so uh, we've got we've got that. Uh, apparently, Olivier Giroux is heading to LAFC. Okay. LAFC is just old person FC. Cool. Um, <laughs> look, I mean, they still have Dennis Boyango, who's young and talented. Don't get me wrong. Um, yes. But. And Oliveira and Bogush and Ordan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But they're just like, I like how they're just like bringing in these, these veteran guys for like. You're you're putting together a heist movie, and you're going to get the Carl Reiner of I I need one more job from you, yeah, and that's that's kind of where we're at. Um, I wonder how much Olivier Giroud's got left in the tank, but also LAFC system will fit him fine. It's more of a sit back and counter system nowadays yeah. under Steve Chirundolo than it was under Bob Bradley. Yeesh. So, I mean, well, I mean, it, it might fit him. Yeah, true. It might might save his legs. True. I'd be able to run more. Yeah. So uh, and it sounds like Hugo Rodriguez was a big part in recruiting in there. So true. Good yes. on him. Yes. Uh, so we've got that to keep an eye on as we go. Uh, Nottingham Forest, uh, according to our friends at the Telegraph, they're they're appealing the four point penalty for violation of profit and sustainability rules. Apparently, uh, in a moment of protest. The, the Football Association has published the full extent of the expletive-ridden verbal assault on Paul Tierney by Nottingham Forest Stephen Reed. And I guess as we, wow, we need to probably play this tomorrow. Following the match with Liverpool earlier this month, Reed was given a two-match touchline ban, fined 5,000 pounds for improper conduct and using abusive and or insulting language toward Tierney after Darwin Nunez's late winner at City Ground. He was found to have called Tierney a, a rooster on three occasions. The first time resulting in a red card. Yeah. The reaction followed a complaint. Obviously, the drop ball that should not have happened that eventually ended up in the goal. So, uh, and it was the game winning goal in that match. So, Reed, once again, no country likes their officials. Don't pretend like you're special. Yeah. Uh, written reasons submitted an offer and insight into the level of abuse directed at Tierney. Uh, Tierney said in his incident report, and it was given in evidence to the independent commission. He mentions that Reed approaches him. He continued to question me, and I repeated that I would speak to him inside. Now the fun part. He then said, it's the same every week, you rooster. I showed him the red card, and then he said, I worked with you, F- I worked with you effing lot every effing week last season. It's the same every effing week, you rooster. Yeah, to to four cards point. Have we ever considered that the prim might be run by Eric Bischoff? Uh, well, I think it would be it would be interesting because then it would be fifty two like and thirty eight. I feel like Eric Bischoff would would at least like we we'd get better storylines, you know. Mm-hmm. And he, at least he could at least he could call the match. Uh, at least he could call it real quick. Yep. You know, like he did with um, like he did with the uh, Victory Road uh, yes. Jeff Hardy Sting thing. Yes. Um. Yeah, man. Like. Maybe like, we consider the prem is just run by Eric Bischoff and the like. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, it, it's four points versus like the Everton situation versus yeah. Manchester City is not ever getting punished. No, no, they're not. Hundred fifteen <laughs> violations, and they're going to lawyer it to death, and they won't get punished. Hey, it's the uh, it's the George Carlin philosophy. It's a big club, and you ain't in it. Nope. Uh, speaking speaking of which, and uh, speaking of other uh, large clubs. Mm-hmm. And I need to find which uh, newspaper it was that had this piece of information. And it has to do with Chelsea. And I'm trying to figure oh, out. God. Michael, head cover your ears. Yeah, pretty much. But it's not necessarily a surprise. Uh, not in the in focus. Not there. Not there. Not there. Uh, 
What was the general thesis? The general thesis was that uh, it is uh, being investigated that uh, Marina Granovskaya, who was the brains of the operation during Roman Abramovich's time, Mm -hmm. received funds from Abramovich while he was uh, not supposed to be doing anything as the head of Chelsea as he was under investigation. It's only a crime if you get caught, boys. Correct. And now apparently it is alleged that uh, Marina Granovskaya has now been caught. Uh, with, with all of uh, with all of this, so uh, so Marina Granovskaya, the uh, apparently there was a loan that was given to her, and then there was a larger loan of about four hundred percent more than the initial amount to help her buy a house, and so it was like one loan was like eight and a half million pounds, and the other was like just under two, and so that that happened when it wasn't supposed to happen. So, uh, so you got that with uh, with uh, Marina Granovskaya now under investigation with uh, the time that she was spending kind of running the uh, kind of running point for uh, Chelsea while Roman Abramovich was not around. And so that's uh, folks ain't folks ain't looking too kindly at that, as they say. No. And it. it uh... Chelsea's going to be in trouble, and I don't know, man. Like again, Eric Bischoff running the prem. Somebody <laughs> pick a lower level. Somebody pick like a jobber club FC. Um, like somehow Norwich is going to get punished out of this. Yeah, yeah, really. Because like, I don't yeah. know, man. Like, talk, talk to Michelle. Talk to Michelle Parvani about that. One. <laughs> well, and that's not to say that Chelsea's above getting punished. They've gotten slapped. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Save, maybe save the Norwich one for next time. City does something dumb. And blatant, yes. Um, city's just city just comes to a comes to the ring with a sledgehammer mm-hmm. and is just doing, you know, the shaggy defensive. Hey, we, hey, we saw you the sledgehammer. No, you didn't. Yeah. No, you yeah, didn't. It's, in, it's in your hand. No, no it's not. That's not. That's not a sledgehammer. It's, it's, it's in my not, hand. Yeah, that's uh, uh just, what's just abject yeah. denial across the board. Yeah, that's uh, the Martin Short uh, lawyer character, uh, Melvin Thurm. He's like, no, no, it didn't happen. He's got the, the long cigarette. Okay, here it is. Facing questions about what she knew of secret payments made under Roman Abramovich amid a continuing investigation into alleged breaches of football spending rules, uh, details of millions of pounds of fees funded by offshore investment vehicles belonging to the oligarch emerged last year as a re- result of Cyprus Confidential. Documents from the files indicate Granovskaya knew about some of the transactions, including a fee paid to the agent of Eden Azard, appears to have benefited personally, Seven and a half million to uh, finance a house, 1.63 for financial tax and legal due diligence. Prem is investigating whether Abramovich secretly subsidized his team by using offshore companies to make payments, which should, under rules designed to ensure fair competition, have been made by the club itself from its own bank account. <sighs> so it looks like well, uh, our friends at Cyprus Confidential uh, mentioned the secret payments. And there's a lot that are going through and you wonder, OK, where is it coming from and where is it going? And if it came from Cyprus to help out Chelsea and it's Abramovich's shadow companies, that's not good. I like how I've bookended my time here with Joey Barton mouthing off again and then Chelsea doing shady uh, financial stuff. It just feels right. Yes. Uh, the survey has come out. Survey says and uh, it is. uh you know, but but I have to before you go. I have to properly, I have to properly introduce the segment. So, uh, welcome to one of our new, uh, our new drop. It's survey time. There we go. So uh, the MLS anonymous executive survey is out. I had to shred this. Yeah. Uh, Twelve of the executives say that Messi and friends are going to win MLS Cup. Three of them actually said Atlanta United. They finished fourth in that. Uh, Supporters Shield, they say Crew's going to win it. That makes a lot of sense. Almost half of them said that. Best move of the winner, they're saying Paintsel. That's a decent one. Good it's one. just weird because they juxtapose that against the fact that they're also like, hey, man, they've way overpaid for him. Mm-hmm. So, yes. like, you're if you're saying that, you're expecting Golden Boot numbers if you're going to tell me that he's the best move of the winter but they overpaid for him you're expecting golden boot golden boot numbers yeah he might Paintsel. do it though yeah. he might do it because joseph paintsel is crazy paintsel forsberg robinson suarez one two three and four yeah uh also suarez has put whatever whatever you put in the russian yes 
uh, in Rocky Four. That's yeah. what you have put in Suarez's knees for now. We'll yes. see how long it lasts. Uh, which team had the best offseason? Ten execs said uh, the Colorado Rapids. Nine because they have a plan. Yeah, <laughs> whether it works or not is is beside the point. Colorado has a plan now. Yeah. You look at Colorado, and you're like, oh, they're not just rudderless. They have an oar. That oar might be made of a trisket. Yes, but it's still an oar. Correct. Uh, is Miami's roster build good or bad for MLS? 18 of the executives said, yes, it's good. Four, uh, four said, no, it's not. And the other five hedged. Good and bad. Have some bravery about you, MLS execs. If you, if you adjust the salary rules after this, then the answer should be yes. Will Inter-Miami win a trophy this year? 19 of the 27 said yes. They didn't say which trophy. They just said a trophy. And so uh, the answer is uh, yes. Players. Who is the most talented player in Major League Soccer not named Lionel Messi? Two-way tie, Denny Buanga and Tiago Almada, 16 of the 29. I like that it's so just viciously split, too, and especially the Almada comment is like, you know, it's Almada and it's not close. Yeah. <laughs> and the other one's like, oh, yeah, Buanga. Yeah. Um, I like just that it's so viciously split. Best keeper in MLS, Roman Berkey got half the votes. Andre Blake is second. <sighs> Andre Blake is just good. He's getting, the, he's going to like basically just do the Kaylor Navas thing where he's like, ah, he's really, really good. Is he the best in the league? Yes. Yeah. Don't best, overthink it. Best defender in Major League Soccer, Miles Glesnes and Walker Zimmerman, one, two, three. Yeah, Walker's falling off a bit. Miles is that guy. Miles fitting really well. Man, I don't know if we've talked about how much like everyone may have won out with the way things have worked. Because Miles goes to Cincinnati. Mm-hmm. Miles fits at Cincinnati. It's working nicely. Um, Atlanta gets Young Gregerson, who, aside from his meniscus blowing up, has been really good. And, and it has a different attitude about him. And it works. Like, Atlanta's, uh, Atlanta's been okay with that. Like, they gave up two goals to Toronto in a weird game, missing a bunch of people happens yep. it, it has been known to happen and you didn't have Sion Gregerson for that who's I think been really good and is a different kind of player I think everyone's gonna benefit from that one by the time it's said and done best midfielder in major league soccer Ty Almada and driver Darlington Nagy yeah. I feel like we're doing the thing with Nagby that we did with LGP where we're giving him his flowers. Like, a, well, we've been giving Nagby his flowers for years, as he deserves. I've, I do wonder if we're giving him his flowers a year too late. Just because I, as good as he is, I think he's starting to hit, not, not fall off completely. I think he's starting to slow down just yeah. a little bit. Yeah. And, and uh, Also, this is Lucho on Acosta erasure. Yeah, well, and he's third, one vote behind. This is, this is the erasure of the guy who was the MVP last year. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Best non-messy attacker in Major League Soccer. Denny Buanga, 16 of the 29 mm-hmm. votes. Uh, I want to see how this looks at the end of the season because Denny Buanga is kind of coming back down to earth with his like expected finishing after last year. Yeah. Um, then it's got to be Cucho and Gigi, I would imagine. It Cucho's is. Cucho's just Cucho an absolute and- menace. Cucho is second. Gigi is third. Gigi is the only other individual not named Buanga or Cucho that got more than one vote. If you want to, if you want to start a hot take firefight with your friends, discuss how uh, Yorgos Yakamaki's missing is as big, if not a bigger deal for Atlanta United than Thiago Almada missing because yeah. of what he gives you up top and the movement and the gravity and the danger he provides. Most underrated player in Major League Soccer. A lot of different votes. Christian rolled on number one. Ryan Gold, Aiden Morris, Jose Martinez, all tied to two. Ryan Gold for sure for me. Like he's just, he, dude's just been doing work out there in out there in Vancouver, man. Yeah, because if you're out there in Vancouver, nobody gets to see you. Yeah. Uh, Driver Kokoro and Coco Kataskia are tied for fifth. Give me a uh, career award in that category to Johnny Russell. Uh, yeah, no doubt. Uh, next MLS player to make a big move abroad. Number one Tiago. and number two. Number one is Tiago. Number two is Caleb Wiley. Yeah. Not Drex. Caleb's sooner rather than later going to end up in Europe. You know, Tiago wants to go. He'll go sooner rather than later. Nah, that's fine. Will Tiago Almada best Miguel Almarone's $27 million transfer valuation? 19 of the 28 said no. 
Yeah, and that's the thing. As long as you're like making a good profit off of it, that's fine. We'll, and we'll you get a percentage of the pass. Yeah, you get a percentage of the pass to go along with it. That's fine. Yeah, just depends on where he goes. Because I think it's it's one of those things where, um, you know, if Madrid comes calling for him, and I think he wanted to go to Madrid at one point, and it just didn't work. Um, if Madrid comes calling for him, I think you take you would take a, I, if it was me. If it's a place he really wants to go, I will take less money now and more money on the sell-on to get him to a place that he wants to be where he's going to be happy and he's going to thrive. Because yeah. you have to find that balance of, yes, we want to maximize profit to this guy. But if you want more players like that to come here, you have to do right by them. I think mm-hmm. Atlanta's done that for the most part. Um, I think clubs around MLS have tried to do that for the most part. But you have to balance that desire for maximizing profit along with making sure that guys are going where they want to be. Yeah. Uh, top head coach in Major League Soccer by a mile, Wilford Nancy. Yeah, carry on. Uh, also, most underrated coach in Major League Soccer, Noonan, Curtin, Pareja, Lacine. Danny two. Noonan? Yeah, Pat Noonan, exactly. Hello. Hello, Noonan. You're number one. But the thing is, is that you had four, nine, 13 different coaches named in uh-huh. this of the 28. And so everybody, everyone, anytime you do underrated, overrated, like it doesn't really matter. Somebody's going to want to go completely off the board and go full hipster. So mm-hmm. just don't, 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 don't think about it too much. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What was the best coaching hire of the off season? Laurent Courtois, number one. I say the best hire was in New York, but. And and that uh, and the the Sandro Schwartz did not make the poll at all. Okay. Artois, Dean Smith, Lacine, one, two, and three. Okay. Uh, top CSO in Major League Soccer. Bezbachenko. Uh, yeah, Same Bez- guy. It's been for years. Bezbachenko, number one, only one. Again, he he built Toronto into a functioning organization. Left and Toronto stopped being a functioning organization, and Columbus went back to being a functioning organization. Uh, should Major League Soccer fully participate in U.S. Open Cup? 20 of yes. the 30 answered yes. Most felt it would be easy to play an Open Cup as as long has long been operated, allow each team to make choices about what the rosters look like when they're on the field. Uh, and that's your survey. So uh, that is that is your that is your survey. And so that is my day. One more for the good guys. There you go. Uh, you got to go back to work, don't you? Yeah, very much so. Bye. All right, bye. So Jared will be back tomorrow, and uh, he'll discuss things there. All right. So gossip, rumor, and innuendo, and I know we're in the plus side, and I know the, that the uh, AR that the fourth has held up the numbers. So uh, gossip, rumor, and innuendo. It's great to catch up with Jared. So um, as always, uh, great to get his perspective on things tomorrow. By the way, full show, nine thirty. Before practice for Atlanta United, Jason uh, parachuting in to give his thoughts as they get ready for Chicago. Kaylor Hodges and our buddies from the USL show will join us at 10 o'clock for their monthly visit. They always visit the last Thursday of the month to break down everything that's going on inside USL. And the topic that we had in hour number one, so we'll get into that. Kaylor messaged me yesterday and he goes, yeah, if there was only something to talk about in Atlanta. So uh, we'll get into that and what happened in the first month of competition in USL and US at championship in league one, Nico Moreno joining us at 10 30. So uh, that is uh, that's tomorrow. And we will always uh, have Nico as, as one of our, as one of our tent posts every single, every single week. Uh, Erling Holland is a transfer target for Barcelona summer of 25. Tell me something I don't know. Uh, Rafaela Pimenta met with Barcelona sports director Deco last month. Ivan Tony could become an option for Manchester United this summer. That's from Fabrizio Romano. United have identified Wolves midfielder Joao Gomez as a replacement for Casemiro. Arsenal considering a summer move for Sporting Lisbon defender Usman Diamande after he stood out during a scouting trip when they were looking at Victor Jokeresh. Three-letter paper, take the information at your own peril. Jokeresh has moved ahead of Ivan Tony on Arsenal's list of new strikers. Uh, potential list, West Ham also interested. Manchester United would bring in England's full coaching staff if they appointed Gareth Southgate as manager in the summer, three-letter paper. Manchester United want to speak to Wolves' Gary O'Neill about a role in a new coaching setup at Old Trafford from the four-letter, meaning the four-letter network, not the four-letter paper. 
Jose Mourinho says he's ready to return to coaching this summer following his departure from Roma. It's from Fabrizio Romano. Keep an eye on the league that we don't promote, endorse, nor condone. Any coverage. Bar, uh, Bayern Munich willing to offer Barca a world record fee for Uruguayan defender Ronald Arujo. Liverpool and, and Bayern Munich keen on De Zerbi as an alternative for Xabi Alonso. That's from Build. Luis Diaz's father says hope has not yet been lost about uh, the winger playing in Spain. That's from Cadena Serre. Wolves leading the race to sign Southampton striker Che Adams when he becomes a free agent in the summer. Ajax exploring a deal for Aston Villa's Tim uh, Iruegbanam. Uh, Sturm Graz won't assign Arsenal's uh, Danish striker at Mika Bideth on a permanent deal following a successful loan. Arsenal open to selling defender Nuno Tavares this summer with Lazio interested. Chelsea listening to offers on Gallagher, Shalaba, and Armando Broja this summer as they try to get under the PSR number. Brighton tracking Nigerian winger Philip Otele, who plays for Cluj in Romania. Real Madrid sent scouts to watch River Plate's 16-year-old midfielder Franco Mastantuono. That's from our friends at 90 Minutes. That is your gossip rumor and innuendo on the day. What to watch and where to watch it. And let's see what to watch. Courtesy of our friends always at Soccer America. It's part of my subscription that I get for them. It's one of the that's one of the subscriptions that I have as a part of my daily reading. The zone, and it's a light day. By the way, the zone here in the U.S. Women's Champions League at 145 and four. Doubleheader there. Paramount Plus has the one match in the Copa de la Liga, Lanús and Union Santa Fe at 8:30. That's on Paramount Plus. Uh, if you really want to go hardcore and die hard and obscure. Catch up with our friends at Fanatis at FNTZ.co slash soccer down here. You can get uh, Nuestra Tele, CDO, For the Fans, Gold TV, All the BNs, Libertadora, Sudamericana, anything going on over in the Middle East and North Africa. Trust me, it's there. Teise as well for their programming. FNTZ.co slash soccer down here. You can pick up Fanatis. Helps out the network. Helps them out as well. And you can feed your diehardness by catching up with our friends there at Fanatis. Uh, a couple of other things uh, before we go. And uh, let's see, what did I miss? Um, oh, promotions. Uh, we got to do. We got to get the promoting done. Uh, comment in uh, the article. Tom says that in the art in the athletic piece that Chris Tierney should have gotten the Revs job instead of Anolfo. But Tom, as you well know, sometimes it's uh, who you know, not necessarily what you do. Tom says he doesn't think he's ready, but I like the option of having someone local. Yeah, and yeah, and one of one of my one of my quotes that I live by comes from The Art of War by Sun Tzu. Trust the local guides for they know the terrain. And the art of war should be in everyone's bookcase. I mean that, everyone's bookcase, because while it was written by Sun Tzu to discuss the art of war, it applies to a lot more things. Trust the local guides for they know the terrain. One of my favorite quotes from the art of war. Uh, so having somebody local to help out, absolutely true. Dell wants to start a GoFundMe for Jared's headphones, by the way. I, I can definitely uh, I can definitely relate to that. Was it three separate times? He had two, he had two sets die, and then he had to transfer to uh, his car, I think, so he could sit in his car and, and talk to us this morning. So, uh, yeah, 9.30 tomorrow, Jason, in the 9.30 half hour. 10 o'clock, Kaylor Hodges, USL Show. Nico Moreno, our buddy from Pulso Sports and the Soccer Bar at 10.30. Uh, let's see, what other promotional stuff? Oh, duh. Uh, I didn't even get to talk about our friends at uh, Kickoff Coffee. So, there we go. Kickoff Coffee and kickoffcoffeeco.com. That is the QR code for those of you who are uh, watching however you're accessing us, either on the YouTubes, the Twitch, or on the 280 character app. Don't forget to use the code soccer down here 15 to get 15% off your purchase. They in turn take 10%, reinvest it into youth games, youth initiatives, and stuff that they have earmarked. Very, very cool stuff from our friends at Kickoff Coffee and kickoffcoffeeco.com. Once again, the code is soccer down here 15. And now, here is the scarf. Once again, to help out our friends at the Marshall Islands, the Marshall Islands Soccer Federation. And they are building a program from scratch. The last country on the planet to build a national soccer program. They want to be, uh, they want to be a, a deeper message. And they want to be a part of the Oceania footprint when it comes to playing the, the beautiful game. Here's how we are helping them out. You probably bought the jersey and you bought the bucket hat. Now you can buy the scarf. Make it a full match set. Matty Cruz 
is on the website modeling the scarf that we have earmarked for them. $32. You can, uh, you know, you can uh, email me, you can DM me, you can reach out to me, however you want to do it. $32 gets sent to you. And if you if you want Abby to deliver it to you, it's 32. If you want it shipped to you in the mail, it's another five. So 32 plus five. And so that is the scarf to help out the Marshall Islands. It's a summer scarf because doing a winter scarf for the Marshall Islands might be a little counterintuitive and it would give them blankets in the winter months. But no, we went we went summer scarf and there's your messaging there. And thanks to our friends at the Marshall Islands Soccer Federation for letting us be a part of the build. They're looking to come back here in October to build the Marshallese community and the Marshallese database when it comes to players because they were in Northwest Arkansas about a month ago and got to catch up uh, with players there, have a camp. They're starting with futsal. They've had futsal on the island, and they're trying to build futsal and football as well. But you can get the scarf. You can help them out. Proceeds go to the Soccer Federation and their build. And so that's, that scarf's going to be there. I've got them here in the office. So if you want one, like I said, reach out to me, reach out to the show, DM, we'll figure it out, and I'll mail it to you. So that's uh, that's your promos on the day. Uh, let's see. So tonight, once again, 5.30, 7.30, I think. Let me double check real quick. But it'll be on our uh, live channel, soccerdownhere.mixler.com, soccerdownhere.mixlr.com. Last night you could have listened to the craziness that was with uh, Maddie and Jason. And the River Ridge Sequoia match that was just absolutely bananas. So today it is Forsyth Central in Denmark, and we will be up there for that. And as I sit here and look at six and eight senior night. Okay, so varsity girls, six o'clock senior night, and it is eight o'clock for boys. So six and eight on uh, soccerdownhere.mixler.com tonight. And I will be up there for both of those matches, and we'll be back here, obviously, tomorrow. Tomorrow, which is Thursday, Stars Mill hosting Macintosh. We have both of those games. I think that's 5.30 and 7.30. So Stars Mill Macintosh tomorrow. Forsyth Central, Denmark today, doubleheader on the network. Tomorrow, Stars Mill and Macintosh, Stars Mill hosting Macintosh. Friday, we're in the mountains for White County, Gilmer County. And really looking forward to all those. And then sleeping in on Saturday. And then getting ready for everything going on at uh, Mercedes-Benz on Sunday, Easter Sunday. And uh, may you bring your Easter candies and be a part of the Easter egg hunt that, Addie was, and that Abby was talking about earlier in the timeline. So uh, high school soccer last night. High school soccer Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We get Saturday off. And we'll see everybody at Mercedes-Benz on Sunday. Back here, 9.05 tomorrow morning. Once again, thanks to our friends at the city of Roswell for letting us know what's going on there with the big press conference they had yesterday as the USL came call and said, hey, we want to do live, work, play in the city of Roswell. It's great to catch up with them. That interview will be posted in its entirety to the network on the app later on today. And also thanks to Tyler Pilgrim and our friends from Scarves and Spikes. After the She Believes Doubleheader, they're going to be at the shiny new hotel across from the Home Depot backyard, and they will do it again. Uh, tomorrow, Dell, it is uh, Jason in the 9.30 half hour, Kaylor Hodges and his band of renown from the USL show to talk about everything USL at 10, Nico Moreno at 10.30 Eastern. So stacked Thursday, opening kickoff will get us off and running at 9.05, and we'll go from there. Friday, once again, our friends from Beyond Goals at 9.30. We can whip around across all divisions starting at 10 o'clock, and uh, – High school soccer later on in the day, on, a, on all those days. So for everybody here at SDH, once again, thanks to Tyler. Thanks to the city of Roswell. Thanks to all of you guys. Thanks to Maddie. Thanks to Jarrett and his wonky headphones and his wonky iPod, iPad, i, i iPhone, headphones, earbud, earbuds, that. So for all of that, thanks for hanging out with us once again. Back at it 9.05 tomorrow. So in under 22 hours, we're back at it again since it is the end of the show. That means I get to do this. Mucha Plata, y'all played safe, and we'll be back at it again tomorrow morning. That's a promise. Busy day today, just as busy tomorrow. We'll see you then.